Welcome to the Exotic Pet Collective. My name is Richard, and today we've got a very special guest joining me for the podcast. Uh, uh, he, he has his own podcast, actually. It's, uh, it, it's very exciting. We'll tell you more about that here in a moment. But I want everybody to welcome to the show Dan from Amphibicast. How you doing? Hey, Thanks for joining hey, me today. <laughs> Super professional here. Yeah. Got a live studio audience. How you doing, Richard? Thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, uh, just, we'll just start off, um, with just a little bit about yourself. Uh, can you tell us about your podcast? Okay. Well, you may hear my frogs going in the background, so <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Um, okay. Well, I've been an enthusiast. I, I guess, I, I guess you could call me an exotics enthusiast for about 30 years now. I'm, I'm 41 now. And I started keeping reptiles and amphibians when I was probably about 11 years old or so. And, um, I got in and out of the hobby in various capacities over the years, and I made some significant life changes within the past five years, and I got back into the hobby as a way to be productive and to you know, get my life to go in a positive direction. And I started the podcast this past July to, uh, 2020. Now, here in New York, we got hit particularly bad with, with COVID, and we were all, you know, locked down as of March and then realistically into the beginning of the summer and things started to lighten up a bit. But I thought to myself, well, what's, what's going to be a good use of my time? Am I just going to sit here in, in my house and really not have anything to show for this? You know, at, at the time it was, you know, it was frightening. We didn't know what to expect next. So I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do something productive, I should be, you know, I should do something that I really enjoy. And after getting back into the amphibian hobby in the past couple of years, I found that there was a lot of questions that I had and there were no podcasts out there that addressed it. There were her podcasts out there and some of them were great and there was still a void. No one really had anything that was specifically geared towards amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders. And I don't mean that just necessarily as a herpers podcast, like someone who keeps um, animals as a hobby, but also other issues like conservation, ecology, veterinary medicine, all, all these topics. I basically wanted this to sort of be this very, very holistic opportunity for people from different disciplines to come together and share their expertise because I found that it was – a podcast is a great media because you're not necessarily going to get a, a massive audience. I mean, Joe Rogan does it, but Joe Rogan is Joe Rogan. Right. Uh, you're not going to get a massive audience, but the audience that you do get is going to be very interested in the material that you're going to provide. So I like to feature guests on the show from a variety of disciplines. I've had veterinarians, I've had field researchers, I've had different breeders. I've had quite a few people. And so far as of this date, I've put out about 28 episodes. And I must admit, I did have an ulterior motive in starting the podcast was because a lot of these questions I wanted to know. You know, I, I wanted to know the answers to a lot of these things. So I had a lot of these guests on the show because I legitimately had questions. I wanted to become a better keeper. I wanted to learn more. And I figured, look, there's a lot of people out there who know more than I do. There are a lot of people out there that are you know, influential in the hobby and they have some great information to share. Well, why don't I get them on the show, not only to answer my questions, but to answer everybody else's questions. And you know, so far it's been, it's been a pretty good success and I'm enjoying it. As long as I continue to have content to put out, the podcast will continue to go on. Very cool. I can relate to that a lot. That's that's it's very similar to to how I got started. It was about a little over five years ago. I made some major life changes myself, and and was like you know trying to get things heading in a positive direction, get things back on track, and uh, and part of that is what what kind of bloomed uh, in my collection. Like I finally was able to like settle down and have a a decent job, and um and and kind of focused a lot of that energy on keeping tarantulas and, and learning more about them. Uh, cause you know, I, I had kept, man, I think my first exotic pet was when I was really young, like maybe like 10, my mom would know, I, I have no memory for those things, but I had gotten a couple of tree frogs and a uh, salamander and, and gnolls. And like, I just really liked reptiles and amphibians. That was kind of like my, uh, my pet of choice. So, you know, growing up in, as a young kid, I, I always had that kind of stuff in the house. And, um, and it, it's, it's strange because now I don't have any amphibians in my collection. So, so I was really excited when we uh, connected on Instagram 
and and had talked about doing this. And honestly, I was I was half expecting you to bail on me today because I bailed on you last week. <laughs> Completely <laughs> forgot. I was like, yeah, he he may not show up, but I deserve it. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. So I apologize for that, and I'm 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 very appreciative that you're willing to come back on, uh, even though I. It, last week was rough. Like I had uh, three interviews actually all lined up and they all ended up having to get canceled uh, just because stuff going on. But you know, it's, it's crazy times right now. Um, so it's, 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 it's a very cool to have you on here and I've got a whole lot of questions. And actually one of my uh, friends from like years and years ago, just hit me up today on Facebook and was asking me a bunch of questions about tree frogs and, uh, or no, not tree frogs, uh, poison dart frogs. He's wanted to get some. And I was like, mm-hmm. I don't know really anything about them, but I'm going to be talking to, to a guy today that does. So I'll, I'll, if you have some questions, I'm going to, I'm going to relay them to him and get you some answers. So by all means, you know? yeah. So you, um, just listening to your, your podcast, uh, today you have, uh, it seems like you talk about a lot more than, than just tree frogs or um, just, uh, dart frogs, right? Correct. I like to vary the content because I mean, at the end of the day, you can only have so many conversations about dark frogs. It, it, it can kind of go in circles. So I like to provide as much of a variety as content as possible because I feel like that's what keeps people interesting. I mean, don't get me wrong. I could wax idiotic about dark frogs all day. But, I, I mean, I, I also keep other – I keep tree frogs. I've kept toads. I've kept so many different things over the years. And there's many, many little subcultures in the amphibian community. You have people who keep newts. You have people who keep – salamanders axolotls dart frogs tree frogs toads there's a there's a toad community and i feel like if i really wanted the podcast to reach the audience that i'm looking to i have to appeal to everybody so i mean my dart frog minions or whatever (laughs) um uh, they do compose the majority of the audience but that's also my comfort zone i keep primarily dart frogs and that just happens to be the area that i'm the most familiar with and you know, I still like to think outside the box, though. In fact, I, I even do I even do episodes uh, that aren't amphibian focused, and um, I I call those my outside the glass box episodes. And I'll highlight some concerns of different species. Like uh, uh, I had an episode about I had Nick Gordon from the Abronia Alliance. Okay. And if anybody, uh, Abronia is a genus of lizards that's native to uh, Central America, and they live in somewhat similar conditions not exactly but they they face some of the same concerns habitat fragmentation there, there's all sorts of different species that are really colorful some of them aren't quite known to science similar concerns so mm-hmm. i like to um offer some content that's also not necessarily frog toad and salamander too because the fact of the matter is many of us keep other species i mean i keep tarantulas yeah i i mean i have about seven species of tarantulas but you know i think that people from all different communities can appreciate that type of content as long as you offer it to them. Yeah, definitely. That's kind of why I, I called this the exotic pet collective because I didn't want to just be pigeonholed or pigeon held into tarantulas. Uh, because I've, I've been running into that problem on my YouTube channel. Uh, I, if I make a video about a true spider or a scorpion and you know, I've got a couple snakes or I've got like four snakes and some geckos and stuff like that in my collection as well. And I was getting a lot of pushback. People are like, Hey, I'm not watching you to see stuff about, <laughs> scorpions i want to see tarantula stuff so uh, i was like if i'm going to do a podcast that and branch out and you know i really should kind of use a name that's going to be a little a little more open uh so we, we can talk about all things because it seems like very rarely does one person just keep one type of of exotic pet like i know most of the people that keep tarantulas also have ball pythons or king snakes or you know they, they've got some kind of snake or reptile in their collection a lot of people that keep mainly reptiles also have a few tarantulas in their collection and people have fish and coral reef tanks and I mean, all, all kinds of different mammals and stuff like that. So it's, it, I think that, you know, kind of confining yourself to just one topic can, can really be a disservice to everybody. Uh, and, and one thing I really was enjoying uh, about listening to your podcast was just some of the guests that you have on. Like I, I enjoy podcasts where it's just a one person talking, but when there's like a conversation and interview you really kind of dig it into to some some deep topics. You know, it, it, it's something I personally enjoy a lot. So I, I was kind of, I was digging, uh, I was like shooting a lot of B-roll today. I was, we were talking earlier of filming, uh, you know, for upcoming videos with your podcast just kind of playing in the background. And I noticed there was, uh, you, you were talking to people from, from all over the country, it seemed. Um, yes. how, where do you meet these people that you have on your show? Well, 
it's a combination of several things. I believe it or not, I do a lot of cold calling to get guests. And I mean, look, you put on a podcast, you have a YouTube channel, you know that it, this, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And I will kind of, you know, I'll, I'll find people who have something that I think people would be interested to hear. I'll reach out to them and I'll usually email people. Sometimes I'll contact them through Instagram, but I, I, I don't like to be like in people's face. You know what I mean? I like to kind of be respectful, extend the offer. Look, if you're interested in coming on and talking about a particular topic, you're, you're more than welcome to. And you know, a fair amount of people reply and I'll set up different topics based around what that person's area of expertise is. Uh, sometimes I'll have people who will flat out ask me <laughs> to come on the show. And if you have something that's, you know, reasonable to talk about, I mean, if I can, if I can develop an episode out of it, then I'll, I'll consider that. Sure. I've done that in the past and uh, I've had some word of mouth. I've had some guests that will refer me to someone else which is also nice because I do like to maintain a relationship with the guests that I have on the show because look, I, you know, it's, it's their show. I'm just some, I'm just some bozo from New York. You know what I mean? I mean, the people that I get on the show are the ones that people want to hear from. Yeah. So I like to keep those relationships open. I like to have people, I mean, now I'm in, in season 28. There are some guests that I'd like to have back because we kind of got cut short, you know, before we could get into every topic that I wanted to address. So how do how do you go about, uh, with uh, with your guests because you've had some pretty diverse uh, diverse people on uh, on your show. Yeah, I, I think it's a little different just because I have the, I had the YouTube channel first, so I, I had a little bit of name recognition out there. And really, uh, initially, it was just calling in favors. <laughs> it was like oh, you know, like hey, I, I helped you all do this thing, or I you know I, I showed you how to do this. So why don't you come on my podcast and talk for a few hours? <laughs> so that's uh that's kind of what what how it all started. Um, yeah, but since then it's. Uh, it, I've had a few people and now it's, it's, it's a lot of people like reaching out to me, like sending me an email or something saying, I heard you talk about this on your podcast. Uh, I specialize in this field. I would love to, to come on and, and we could talk about this at more detail because you know, you, you didn't know what you're talking about or something like that. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, that's where I've been getting a lot of, a lot of people recently. Um, and there was a, it, it also just the people that listen, um, you know, they, they tell me that they would like to hear uh, from somebody, you know, like mm -hmm. I had a couple of people, a couple of listeners that actually reached out to people like, and were like, Hey, you should go on Richard's podcast. And I'm like, who the heck is that? And I didn't know who they were. And they kind of like played middleman and put us together, uh, which is always cool. Mm -hmm. um, and that like, we're about the same age. Um, yeah, it yeah. seems like we've had a similar kind of life in some areas. And like, this is probably the only way I get to meet people right now. <laughs> like, uh, I don't, I don't go out and do stuff. So, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, this is this is how I I you know make friends I guess. <laughs> well, that's what I liked about your podcast is because you know like we were talking before about like the podcast as a media. I mean, I'm not I'm not a social media person. I'm not YouTube. I'm not Facebook. I'm not anything. I, I have my Instagram page to promote the show because to me that's the most I guess you could say neutral in terms of you know social media outlets. But when you have a podcast. It, your audience isn't going to necessarily be as large as it would be if you were doing YouTube videos or TikTok or, or whatever it is that, you know, that people do for, for uses of visual media. Yeah. But your audience is going to be a lot more loyal, I guess you could say, because I have listeners who I interact with on a regular basis because look, they're the, they're the ones giving me the input. You know, if they're listening to the show, they like the show. So I want to hear what they have to say. And people will give me input. They'll say, look, I'd like to hear about a particular topic. I might put a post up on Instagram, you know, just asking, hey, listen, you know, what do you guys want to hear from next? Is yeah. there a typical, particular topic you want to hear? And I get I get feedback and I value the feedback from my audience because, look, at the end of the day, they're the ones listening to it, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, enjoy, I really enjoy listening to podcasts. I listen to all kinds of different podcasts on all kinds of subjects and it got to the point where I was, uh, I wanted to kind of expand beyond just YouTube just cause you know, they're Google and YouTube is, they're just very fickle. So it's like, especially if I'm going to rely on this as an income at any moment, they could yeah. just cut the strings to that for really no reason. And there's no recourse or <laughs> any, like, and there's really no competition that you could go to. So, you know, I was like, I, I want to expand and I tried TikTok and I still play around on TikTok every now and then, but as far as like a, a medium, I, I don't enjoy it very much. Like, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's fun to laugh. Uh, at some funny TikTok scrolling through there, but making content and posting and interacting with people on that platform can be very difficult. 
um, maybe I'm just old, but the podcast I, I really enjoy because I get to meet people and, and to have a long in-depth conversation with them, learn a lot of stuff. And like you were saying, the people that do listen to it, you know, um, they're really listening and involved and, and invested in it. I mean, if you're going to listen to something for an hour or two hours, you, you got to care about what the topic is or the people that are speaking. So it's, it's a completely different kind of relationship with, um, you know, your listeners. You just don't get on, on, on other uh, media platforms. Um, I do have a, is that a, is that a tree frog or a, a, a dart frog in the background? That's chirping. That's a dart frog. That is, I'm trying to see which one um, you can't, I mean, I'm in my frog room now, but yeah, um, those guys call up. That's, uh, I have, well, it's more, it started out as a sex trio, but those are my, uh, Epipeda babies, Anthonii, and the locale is Santa Isabel. All so right. We, um, we, in the dart frog hobby, we generally go by scientific names the same way as the tarantula community does. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's funny because I'll like my white tree frog is Latoria, um, Carulia is a scientific name, but no one calls them that. But when it comes to dart frogs, we generally go by, um, you know, go by uh, scientific names, which is another thing that is I liked about the, the tarantula hobby too. Was it kind of keeping it like a, uh, you know, more of a high level? But yeah, those guys they'll call. I mean, they're all oh, if I showed you how big they are, they're about the size of a quarter. Oh yeah, they, got big, they make yeah they make a lot of noise for a little frog, and they'll call at night. They'll call in the morning, and um, they're just they're a great species to keep because they're actually they're really hardy. They reproduce really well, and they've got a a beautiful red coloration. Yeah. It's just, they're, they're fun. They're probably, they're probably my favorites, even though they're not particularly rare or anything like that. But yeah. they're, just, they're a cloud, they're a crowd pleaser, you know? you know? Yeah. I mean, some of my favorite tarantulas are the most basic and, <laughs> you know, like readily available. Yeah. When you get, you're getting into like the more rare, uh, you know, fancy ones, like, yeah, they look cool, but you hardly see them. You know, like some of the most beautiful tarantulas or most rare tarantulas out there spend 90% of the time in hiding. So you, you never really get to enjoy them other than like when you're rehousing them and stuff. Uh, I, my, yeah. my knowledge of tree frogs or dart frogs, I'm sorry, is very limited. Like uh, my pretty much the only, the only ones I've really seen in person are at like local chain pet stores. You know, anytime I'm, I'm in like Petco or PetSmart or something like that really? and I'm buying crickets and, and things of that nature, I'll see a few that they have for sale. And it just, it's like, yellow poison dart frog or blue poison dart frog or red really? poison dart frog. <laughs> like a, I, I've heard about them making it into big box stores. Yeah. I know. I, I don't have that near me. Um, I don't know what that, what that's a function of, but um, I, I have heard of it, but they, there's about three, there's probably three species that you'll see for sale at a big box store. They're um, Dendrobates tinctorius, Dendrobates erratus and um, what's the other one? Uh, Luke, uh, the Luke's Lucamelis. Um, they have like the yellow bumblebee kind of looking things. Yeah, they're generally considered the three. I can think of beginner, better beginner species, but on the whole, those three species have caveats of their own. But they're generally pretty hardy. I mean, again, I have my, I have different ideas in terms of what constitutes a good beginner species, but. Um, they're, they're relatively hardy, so that's probably why they they have them for sale there. Although I don't know how much of a market there is for them, because I don't generally see people buying them casually the way I would see other species. Yeah, well, I think uh, the issue with it is, I mean, one, just from being in the tarantula hobby, I know that uh, a store like that, especially when they don't even have the species listed, it's just you know yeah. the color and and a general common name. It's probably you, you don't really know what you're getting, uh, and they don't yes. know what they're selling. And mm -hmm. so it, and I also, I, I see how they're keeping them, you know, just, I mean, they keep them probably as poorly as they do tarantulas, you know, like an inch of substrate. So they can't really hide anywhere. They're out there in the open, but they are fascinating yeah. to watch. Like they're beautiful. And I've, I've, I mean, for over a year now, I I've really been tempted to add some to my collection. Uh, but I just kind of, you know, it, it's not my area of forte. And it's also like, I, I'm really kind of like clamped down on not adding a lot of new stuff uh, right now, you know, just cause I, I to me, it's it's more important to take care of what you have. You know, it's quality over quantity. And I've got a lot of quantity at the moment, even though tarantulas are so much easier to take care of than reptiles and amphibians. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's like, I just, I feel like I, I'm at that level where everything's in a good balance right now. I don't want to add something large uh, or high maintenance and kind of, you know, throw, I just don't want anybody to, to not get the, the care uh, that they deserve. But, 
you know, I, I do have a friend who just reached out to me, uh, a guy named Elijah, known from way back. And uh, he's actually thinking about getting uh, a poison dart frog um, for his, I guess, his kid. But it also sounded like it was for him as well. And he was asking me a lot of questions <laughs> yeah. about it. <laughs> and I, I was like, uh, well, well, I, you know, I told him I was talking to you today. Uh, I sent him links to your podcast. I was like, you know, definitely listen to this guy. Um, so, you know, for somebody like him or for somebody like me, uh, what, what is the best place? Like, where is a good place to get them? What species should you get? Like, how do you start off keeping poison dart frogs? That's a good question. Cause I didn't want to tell him, you know, go to Petco. Cause I, I I'm like, going to I'm gonna preface what I'm going to say by you know, I, I'm not the end all be all expert. You know, okay. I, I've been keeping for a long time. I like to stay current on the hobby, different species that are available, caveats to care. I, I read a lot of scientific papers. I read a lot of literature. So I, I try to keep, you know, as up to date as possible because people do ask me questions. But, you know, I, I, I'm going to give it just from my own personal experience. So I don't take everything I say as, as canon. But yeah, if you were starting out, I think the best thing to do would be to find another keeper who has more experience than you and speak to that person, find out what this person does, what their care routine is like, what species they're keeping, what species they recommend. Because there are species that people would normally shy away from that can actually be very good beginner species. I mean, the same as it is with the, with the tarantula community. You'll have people yeah. say, that, oh, you can only keep old worlds uh, excuse me, you can only keep old worlds after you've kept new worlds for, you know, quite some time. Well, I, I don't keep old worlds yet because again, I've, like you said, I've tried to keep my collection small, but, um, you know, to answer your question, it's just like any other hobby. I would find someone who can kind of mentor you, give you some ideas in terms of what species, you know, they would recommend. Um, and you're going to really want to get your husbandry down because I mean, technically, all right. Dart frogs are not necessarily as hard to keep as we hobbyists make them out to be. Um, that's kind of like an inside joke is that we, we make them out to be this holy grail of herbs, and they're really not that difficult. If you can master the husbandry, you can master the care. But there are some things that you're really going to need to get familiar with first. Now, really the most important thing to consider is that the majority of dart frog species are microphages. They will only eat very, very small prey, with the exception of um, like some of the phylobates species and possibly some of the larger tinctorious locales, they generally only eat anything that's, that's about the size of a, a of a uh, hidey eye. So, uh, fly. so, so you're talking about like like uh, springtails, flightless fruit flies. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the springtails in a bit, but um, yeah. you have to be good at culture and fruit flies. So depending on how large your collection is, if you're going to have one or two frogs, you're going to want to have a readily readily supplyable source of fruit flies now most of us in the hobby culture our own because it's cheaper and it's easier that way plus a lot of us are like the tarantula community will have a fairly large collection and i've got last count probably close to 30 frogs but a lot of the big commercial breeders they have you know they have hundreds of frogs so they're making hundreds and hundreds of you know well not hundreds and hundreds but they're making a lot of cultures each week so you have to be able to get that so if you live out in an area where you cannot get a ready supply of fruit flies at like the local store, um, you're going to have to culture your own, which means you're going to have to order some. And um, it's not exceedingly difficult. There's a lot of really good tutorials out there on YouTube, but you have to be comfortable with tiny little bugs. And depending on your enclosure, how, you know, fruit fly proof it is, which really none is, you're going to get, and I've got one like just came right in my face. Um, you're going to want to be comfortable with fruit flies. And I know that a lot of the tarantula uh, keepers, a lot of invert keepers don't generally like fruit flies. I know some of the mantis people, they'll, they'll, they'll feed Heidi eye, but I know people don't like them because they escape and they get all over the place. But that's a big part of the process is, you know, just like anything else, if you can take care of the feeders, then you can take care of the animal itself. So if you're going to be going with a species like, i um, trying to think of a good example. We'll pick them. Like you, you saw, it was probably Dendrobates tinctorius, which was a lot of the locales are blue. Is that, that kind of sound like familiar or? Yeah. Okay. Depending on which species, like the, the, um, the tinctorius or we call them tinks, they'll really won't eat anything bigger than a, than a high DI fruit fly, which is the larger, the, the two commonly available fruit fly species. Whereas like the phylobates genus, 
they'll eat my my guys will eat like half inch crickets. Mm. So they don't breed as easily and they're more expensive. So people don't see them. But as a beginner species, like they're easier. So if you want a species that will eat crickets, you'd want to pick the species accordingly. So the average person going into that big box store and leaving with a couple of tanks, you have to realize you got to be good at culture and culture and fruit flies. That's like your most important thing. Springtails. Yes. Especially for small frogs or frogs that won't eat because some frogs will only take really, really tiny prey. And for that springtails come in really handy. Okay. The other thing that's going to be really important is you don't want to pick a good species. Now, Dendrobates tinctorius can be really territorial. And if you put two of them in the, I mean, you, I, I have a pair that I've raised since they were frogless and they do okay. If you put another tink in there with them, they're going to actually like throw down like pro wrestling. I'm, I swear to God, they will just throw right. down and fight each other because they're extremely territorial. But yeah. other species aren't like the Leucomillus, the, the, the yellow and black ones that you saw. Those can generally be kept in groups. The Phyllobates genus, most of those frogs can be kept successfully in groups. So don't go based on the color of the frog because that frog could have very, very different husbandry requirements than another. Like my tanks, with the exception of those two, I keep them all separate, which means that if you want to keep multiple tanks, odds are you're going to have to either have a sexed pair that gets along or you're going to have to have multiple vivariums or a place to separate a frog if that dynamic changes. So you're going to want to pick a species that's a beginner species. I tell people stay away from tinctorias, even though they're commonly available. There's lots of locales. I would honestly recommend Phyllobates as a better beginner genus, just because they accept larger prey. They can be kept in groups. There are some caveats to them as well, but um, you know that's the, the the feeding aspect of it is is very very important. It's Another aspect that I would also say would be important again, but besides the social dynamics, because that's a big that's a big issue with different species. I feel like it takes a little bit more discipline to keep dart frogs than other species because it's not necessarily that their care is more difficult. It's just that, in my opinion, anyway, and people will disagree with me. That's fine, but I think that it takes more discipline than other species. Meaning, like if you can if you can maintain a like a reef aquarium. You, know, yeah. you have the discipline that goes into that regular maintenance that kind of preps you for it. But if you're used to keeping, you know, like I, I don't like to pick on snake people, but let's just say that you keep, um, what's a good example. Right, I'll pick a snake that I keep. I keep blood pythons. Let's just say that you have a blood python, which basically sits in one spot and you don't need to check on it every single day. It can eat every couple of weeks or, or what have you, or it can go for a long time while feed depending on your condition and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can't go away for two weeks at a time and expect these guys to, you know, manage themselves. You have to make sure that they, their humidity is right. You have to make sure that they're fed. I mean, I generally feed every couple of days, which is kind of the standard. Some people, sometimes I feed more. So if you're going to go on vacation, you got to have, you know, a buddy who's going to be Johnny on the spot, taking care of your collection because you can't just leave these guys. I mean, with, with like, with my tarantulas, I know if I go on vacation, I mean, I don't go on vacation because I have no life anyway, but <laughs> um, you know, I know that those guys can sit for weeks. I mean, yeah. I, you know, my, my, uh, my Fauna Pelma Calcoides can go for probably a year, you know, yeah, but these yeah. guys, you have to have some discipline. You have to be willing to put in, you know, to the regular care that's involved. So, that's another big part of it is, you know, do you have the time? You know, if you travel a lot, if you go away, you know, you got to monitor these conditions because if, if things can go south quick, you know, if you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're, I mean, I mean, they can, they can survive, you know, a, a broader range of temperatures than possible, but you know, you leave the tank open with the heat going in the winter time, it's a lot of that moisture is going to evaporate. And that in and of itself can be a problem because they do need a decent amount of humidity. So, I mean, that's not to discourage anybody, but as long as you can kind of master that regular care that's needed, if you have the discipline to do that, then I think anyone can can successfully keep them, you know? Yeah. I mean, that got, kind of highlights some of my misconceptions coming into this. Um, I, I was under the impression that all of the dart frogs were communal uh, and not just, you know, and, and it was, it was maybe wasn't something I, I assumed. Uh, I was actually kind of wanting to ask you about this. Um, you know, when, when I go to the pet store and I see that they got dart frogs, they have the different colors is pretty much how they have them, uh, <laughs> kind of, uh, separated, but they have them in their own enclosure. 
Uh, but I had been hearing people talk about it, or maybe it was uh, the person that worked at the pet store when I was talking to them about it. <laughs> but they were pretty much saying you can mix and match them. You know, it's like, <laughs> like is that? Oh, wow. uh, I, I'm assuming that's similar with tarantulas. Like they they don't prefer. Chem- I mean, I, I, you can't mix species, right? Is that is that a bad idea? The general consensus in the dart frog community is that you don't mix. You definitely you, know, you don't mix species, and you definitely don't mix locales. And by locales, I mean. Tinctorius is a good is a good example. So if you Google, uh, I mean I, I, can't, I hate Google, but if you if you Google Dendrobates tinctorius, you're going to see this whole color palette of different looking animals that don't even look like they're members of the same species. But those locales are essentially a function of an isolated population that has sort of evolved to have its own coloration, mm-hmm. and it's not just tinctorius; it's, it's many other species as well. A lot of the, the, the thumbnail species in the Ranitomea genus and whatnot, but um, I'm just to answer your question, you know, as clearly as possible, uh, no, you don't want to do that because you don't want the bloodlines of the locales to get muddied down and different species will have different, you know, interactions with each other. So, I mean, I've heard of people doing different things. I personally don't approve of it, but there are certain people out there who can pull it off. Mm -hmm. But if you're that guy, you don't need my advice. You know what I mean? So it, it has been done. I personally discourage it. I would never mix and match them. I would never keep them communally. I mean, it's like in the tarantula community. I mean, I know that like keeping um, M. Belfori is kind of a, a trend now, keeping them communally. I know people have different ideas about that, but yeah, you know, you on, I know on the other hand, you know, in the hobby, you want to avoid, you want to avoid hybrids. So that's what you don't want. You don't want, these bloodlines getting muddied down by, you know, incidental hybridization. So it's very easy to have two different locales of tinctorius that look incredibly different. You might get a sexed pair. They might reproduce and what you end up with is a hybrid. And that doesn't have, I hate to use this term, but that doesn't have any value in the community. And it's generally frowned upon. It's generally discouraged. Okay. Uh, so, is co- so is generally cohabitating with other species. Other people do it. You know, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be, you know, cause a whole, you know, controversy. I personally discourage it. I don't, you know, amphibians are not social animals unless they're breeding and they don't need, you know, they don't need to be kept communally. They don't benefit from it unless you're actively breeding. You really shouldn't be keeping dart frogs communally unless it's certain species. Like I said, like phyllobates, you know, my little chunky monkeys, you can't really see, you can't really see them, but, um, they're right behind me. Uh, then you can keep communal fine as long as, you know, they're members of the same species, but I don't believe in mixing, you know, and that's one of the misnomers out there is that, you know, just because you, they're the same species, you can put them together and mix them and match them. It's not a box of crayons. It's not a box of Crayolas that you can just mix out. Yeah. Some people do it. I will go on record and say, I disagree with that because it doesn't benefit the animal. It only benefits you. Yeah. I didn't mean to stumble into a controversial topic. No, there. Right. <laughs> I was just kind of curious. Uh, because yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big thing in the tarantula hobby is, I mean, right now the Imbalfori communal seems to be somewhat accepted as, you know, the, you know, the, maybe they don't prefer it, but they will tolerate each other and they seem to do, you know, decently in a communal, but you know, big, but because you have success with that one unique species now, you, you know, you got, I mean, I've been keeping 20 years and I mean, 20 years ago, people were saying a Vicularia, Vicularia could be kept communally and, I mean, that's yeah. pretty much been proven time and time again. Uh, that's not, <laughs> that does not work. Uh, you usually end up with just one fat tarantula. In fact, uh, I had uh, someone on uh, the last podcast I recorded who's, you know, done a lot of studying um, in college on avicularia. And and that was, you know, that their whole thing was like, it, it was a, it's like this reoccurring theme. Like uh, people want to keep avicularia communally. It gets proven it's a bad idea. Five years later, somebody comes up with this great idea that we should keep a vicularia communally. And it doesn't matter that people have tried it in the past. It, it, it happens again. And, but in the tarantula lobby, you see that with uh, like a Neotheli insi. Um, there's a few other species that, you know, people, they get excited and they're cheap and readily available. And they're like, well, let's put a bunch into an enclosure and see what happens. And it's like, yeah, it's not a good idea. You know, and it's it's very frowned upon to, to mix uh, species. Uh, you know, it's you get a hybrid, it's usually like, I'm not going to breed this and we just, we'll keep it until it dies and, and try to keep the bloodlines, uh, you know, nice and, and clear. But when you look at the reptile hobby, especially like ball pythons, 
Like it, they're constantly mixing morphs and, and breeding and interbreeding and, and all this kind of stuff. So I guess in my mind, I just assumed the amphibian hobby was like the reptile hobby where there was, you know, you got to, you're breeding different colors of, of crested geckos to try to come out with some amazing hybrid or uh, a morph, I guess would be the right word. That's going to, you know, catch a, a very high price tag for a while. Okay. So I, you know, that, that's just my uh, misunderstanding, I guess. So just no, to clear up though, there's okay. species, like there's a genus and a species for the, for the frog. But then on top of that, there's also a locale that yes. kind of, okay. Cause I know a lot of times with tarantulas, it, if it's a different locale, it's just, they just call it, even if it looks identical, it's just a different species uh, ex- yeah. with the exception of avicularia. Now a whole bunch of those species just got put into one uh, genus and, and species. Now there's like six or I, I, last time I checked, I think there were six morph types of avicularia, avicularia that. You know, a lot of them used to be like a Vicularia Metallica, you know, they, so they kind of doing weird things in that genus. But yeah, so, so with, uh, with the, the dart frogs, the, it's not, it, it, it is uh, separated even further beyond just species into locales. Yes. And I think um, it, it's what, you, it was a very good question that you had. And that's actually something that I didn't even, I didn't even think to address, but it's, you, you brought up a really good point. Um, as far as dart frogs go, there are quote unquote morphs, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Basically what you have is you have a, a number of speed. There's, there's a, a whole number of genera and the ones that we'll, we'll touch on some of the ones that are more commonly available in the hobby, but mm-hmm. let's, let's take Dendrobates tinctorius because they are kind of a hobby staple and there's many, many different locales. Now, these locales are their locales. You will find members of the same species that might be on opposite sides of a river that look completely different. That's just how they've evolved. So their variation in coloration is a function of just the natural world. You know, they're not, yes, people do selectively breed certain lines, like some, like right now, um, Dendrobates tinctorius. Uh, Azurius. Azurius used to be considered a separate species, but now it's part of Tinctorius. Uh, people will breed for, for fine spot, which is just a certain type of pattern. But on the whole, I mean, you've got probably countless numbers of locales. So all it takes is one body of water or a valley or something like that to separate a, a group in the same species, and they will just, they've evolved their own unique coloration. So there aren't morphs per se. Like it's not like when you go to a reptile show and you're going to see. God, like however many, I haven't kept ball pythons in years, but like however many ball python morphs there are, um, you know, that's, that's a function of, of selective breeding, um, you know, looking for those traits. Whereas with dart frogs, you really don't have to do that because there's so many amazing locales out there that you don't, you don't, you don't have to do that. You, you can just, you can, I mean, if I, if I I'm trying to think of a good resource, um, I mean, if you go pick up really any good book about dart frogs, there's, there's a book that's it's actually in German. I had the English version of it. I think it's called Pamilio, like the complete Pamilio. But it's got a whole chapter just locate just on locales of just Ulfaga Pamilio, which is another species, which has this many, many, many locales. And you know, some of the range of these locales is really, really small. So you might be dealing with an animal that might live in, you know, quarter mile. Yeah radius you know but we generally want to discourage you know the intermixing of locales because you dilute that bloodline and you don't get a hybrid because you're mixing two members of the same species but you're going to get an animal that's not going to be a true representation of the locale that you that you wanted to represent i understand it's a, it's a little more complicated than what i had, had thought it would be I'm, <laughs> going yeah, I'm into sorry. it i'm but... not making it, if I'm making it out <laughs> Too well, much. No, no, yeah. I mean, it, it's very interesting, though. So, do dart frogs need? First off, when I when I I look them up online, stuff like that, um, they're referred to as poison dart frogs. But from okay. the little bit of research that I was doing, it was showing that when they're kept in captivity, the diet that they have in captivity pretty much renders any poison inert or something like, like they're not poisonous. Is that is that true? Yes. Now, technically. All right. the the name poison the name poison uh, poison arrow frog or poison dart frog goes back quite a while where um, native people in Central and South America would use 
um, they would take, well, there's only, okay, well, there's only three species that you would consider poison dart frogs, and they're all members of the Phylobates genus. You've got Phylobates terribilis or terribilis, depending on how you pronounce it, uh, Phylobates bicolor, and I think the other one is, oh, God, it's, 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 it's eluding me at, at this moment. I can't remember what it is. I can't remember what the third one is. But in any event, these frogs produce toxins that they sequester from the insects that they eat. So their diet in the wild, they essentially they, they sequester that and they release those toxins through their skin, which is it's, it's extremely lethal. So native people would use those frogs. They would rub their arrowheads against them and they would use them to hunt with. And I, I, years ago, I saw footage of it. Um, it was... Uh, you know, it was a group of uh, you know, a group of people who were native to the area, and they dipped an arrowhead in, you know, on the back of a, uh, you know, one of the one of the phylobates, uh, some member of the phylobates genus, and they they shot. I think it was a spider monkey or something like that, and this thing just went down. So those toxins are, um, they're not to mess around with, but they lose those toxins, and they lose that toxicity in captivity because you can't create that natural diet that allows them to produce those toxins. I mean, there's, there's, if you really want to get into it, a, there is a fair amount of research out there. But, I mean, just to put it like, you know, as, as I guess as simply and succinctly as possible is, yeah, there's there's no dart frogs that are um, poisonous in captivity as long as they've been kept captive for like a certain period of time where those toxins would just no longer be produced. So irony, though, and it, it's in Canada, I think it might be, might be, I think, the city of Toronto. Um Phylobates, members of the Phylobates genus are outlawed as a dangerous wildlife. Really? But they're not poisonous. They're not, they're not poisonous in captivity. Yeah. So, so, but that's just a prime example. Yeah. Other species do have, um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily call them toxins. I, I, I don't really quite know the appropriate scientific term to describe it. Uh, even I did just take a class in it recently, but, um, there are frogs that can produce, they can produce, I guess you'd call it maybe like a mild type of toxin, which you, you will feel it. Yeah. Uh, that does happen in the circum under certain circumstances. And I have actually, I've heard other people having this experience. I don't know if it's just me, but I've heard about people who have had a certain species, actually of the Epipetobates that I keep. I've heard that they've kept them in captivity in like outdoor grounds, like in an outdoor greenhouse. And they did actually somehow manage to produce some, you know, mild toxicity. I mean, they're a mild species anyway, but I did have one jump on my hand once. And I swear to God, I felt like, you know, the weird, like radiating, like pain. So oh, wow. I, I cannot attest to the veracity of that. That might've just been me. Yeah. But I mean, you generally don't want to handle these things anyway because their skin is so fragile. But for all intents and purposes, no, you're not going to die from, you know, coming into contact mm -hmm. with these things. But you're not going to want to touch them anyway because their skin is just like, you know, it's very delicate. Yeah. Now, are most of the um, species that are available in the trade, uh, like if you're wanting to go out and purchase one from a dealer online or, you know, at a shop or a reptile expo or something like that? For the most part, are they all captive bred, or is there a problem with uh, wild caught uh, being introduced in the pet trade? The wild caught subject is open for debate. Now, the thing about wild caught is everything was originally wild caught. And mm -hmm. when I was younger, I remember in the early, I mean, dog frogs came into the hobby in, into the 80s, and there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of influential people. You know, I don't like to get into naming names and whatnot, but there was a lot of influential people in the late 80s and the early 90s who brought a lot of frogs in, you know, because they were that, you know, they were wild caught. And that was how the hobby started. But over time, captive breeding kind of took over and the need, there really shouldn't be a need to pull frogs from the wild. And people do, you know, different countries import and export, uh, excuse me, export uh, certain countries, certain countries don't. You really, if you're, especially if you're a beginner, you are going to want to get a captive bred frog because you eliminate the likelihood of getting a frog that's going to come in stressed because the plane ride from South America to New York or from Europe to here or wherever, it's a long plane ride. And these things can stress out very, very easily. So wild caught animal is going to come in probably with a heavy parasite load, which is going to be exacerbated by stress. And you're going to end up with a sick animal. that's going to fail to just generally fail to thrive. And I've seen, I've, I've had experiences with, uh, with wild caught animals yeah. That didn't well because they're you know they're small, they're stressed from a long journey, 
And um, some of them just don't respond well. So going captive bred is the way to go, especially for the beginner. I mean, you can you can get wild caught if you're if you know if you know what you're doing. I, I'd recommend I would recommend captive bred over wild caught to a beginner any day of the week. I have, um, you know, I've dealt with wild caught in the past, and unless you really know what you're doing and you want to incorporate these animals into your your breeding project, I would generally avoid it. You know, it's not not to say that it can't be done, but you're gonna, you know, you get a thirty five dollar wild caught Ophaga familio at an expo. If that thing doesn't thrive, then you're gonna put a tremendous amount of money into, you know, hopefully getting it in front of a vet, doing you know, doing fecal doing fecal exams, checking for parasites, medicating it, et cetera. And unfortunately, sometimes by the time that opportunity presents itself, you realize that there's a problem, it's already too late. Mm. Because they can stress out very, very easily. Whereas, you know, the, the captive bred frogs are generally more tolerant because we've been working with them for almost 30 years. Sure. You really don't there, there's really no reason. I mean, it's the same thing with the tarantula hobby. I mean, dude, if you can get I mean, I'll pick LP. It's just because it's a common species. But if, I mean, if you get a sack from an LP, yeah, and there's a thousand spiderlings in that sack, why would you even remotely need to go collect them from the wild? You know what I mean? Yeah. Unless you were trying to bring in a fresh line to introduce the breeding project. So I, I stay away. Stay away from wild caught. Unless you, you know, if you know what you're doing, then you can get into wild caught. But for the average average person, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, I mean, I think the tarantula hobby for the most part the majority of the species you're going to come across available for sale from reputable dealers, at least are all going to be, you know, captive bred usually by them or by people that do business with them. Uh, the issue does come into a, a effect when you go to a lot of the smaller reptile expos, like maybe not like the largest ones in the, in the U S but then you have uh, people that don't normally sell uh, tarantulas. Like you'll have ball Python dealers or gecko dealers or something like that. At the end of the table, they've got four or five tarantulas for sale. You know, or, or like, oh, just a whole bunch. Of, and they, they don't know what the scientific name is. They don't know if they're male or female. Like, they don't really know anything about it. Uh, and, and it's in almost every case, those are wild caught. And it seems to be, at least in the tarantula hobby, more of a, uh, a financial um, motivation. You know, like, you know, they're, especially uh, with the Afana pelma species here in the U.S., some of the Brocky pelma species, you know, they're just, they just go out and, the desert or whatever, and we'll pick a bunch of adult, you know, adult tarantulas up because they sell for a lot more than spiderlings. And it can take a while for this. Like they're not doing it to try and freshen up the blood or anything like that. Uh, as far as breeding, they, they just, they see a tarantula and they're like, Oh, you get $200 for that. So I'm just going to scoop it up and, and take it to a reptile expo and, and sell it. So I didn't know if that was, if there was that kind of uh, greed or financial motivation uh, in the yeah. dog frog hobby where people would just be importing them or, you know, uh, brown boxing them, smuggling them out of countries, essentially just to sell. I'm a, a, I'm a, I have always been, and I am a big proponent of being responsible in the hobby. And yeah. part of that responsibility is realizing that the animals that you work with are living things and you are providing people with, what might very well be, you know, an introduction to the hobby. There are a lot of very good vendors out there who work with dark frogs exclusively. I personally prefer to deal with people who work exclusively with the, with a specific, with a specific species. And that's realistically for everything. Now going back, I mean, when I went to expos, cause we haven't had expos in New York since the last expo I went to was, in, was I think in January of 2020 or 2019. Yeah. Whatever, but it's it, 20, it would have been 2020. But when you go to an expo, look, I understand people have to make a living, I understand that. But if you are selling an animal, you should know what you're selling, where it came from, and what its care is. I understand expos are busy places, but you know, look, real recognizes real, and if you know what you're doing, you get those people to come from to come to you. Um, ask questions, you know, if someone's got a, tr if someone's got a table and it's all dark frogs, talk to that person, find out what they know. You know, if they've got other species as well, you know, then they're just a dealer. Look, like I said, I understand you have to make a living, but you know, odds are those are wild caught. You know, if I go to a table and the, and the vendor's got, you know, 20 ball pythons, 20 corn snakes, and then, you know, a, a whole bunch of deli cups of, of you know, a fauna pelma calcodes, and then they got a whole bunch of deli cups for, of like Ophaga pamilio, which is a species of dart frog, selling for like twenty five dollars. Whereas I know captive bred ones can go up into the hundreds. I'm not going to buy from that vendor. And you really, 
want to make you want to base your decisions on that because yes just as in the tarantula world that does happen in the frog world and it, it, it is pretty rampant i mean guaranteed you know exportation and you know rather importation of captive it, it, it's legal uh excuse me importation of wild caught it's, it's legal but i personally would discourage it because in this day and age we really don't need to do that anymore you know the average person doesn't need to buy a wild caught animal and like i said you know with with, with and a phone of palma calcotes i mean no offense but the thing's a pet rock you know what i mean like mine she she, she borrows i have a mature female which is wild caught i mm-hmm. i, I fess up she's wild caught got her a while ago but you know, she digs down in her burrow around October, comes out around April. So I, I'm not necessarily concerned for her being, uh, you know, sick with some of the same concerns that I would see with a frog. So it, getting getting a wild caught dart frog is usually more risky in terms of the animal's well being than a wild caught tarantula. Under not under every circumstance, but under the ones that we usually see them in the United States. Like you said, you know, a lot of people out west just kind of pick them up off the ground, sell them for top dollar as a mature female or whatever. But, you know, if you live out in like Texas or Arizona, you know, the thing probably lives five feet from your house in a borough somewhere and you could probably get it for free. But. Right. And we had an issue. Uh, it's been a few months now, but there was, uh, well, when I say an issue, uh, there was maybe like three or four reported cases. Um, and honestly, it could have been like one or two that just kind of got retold and told again, you know, social media can be, but, there were people that were buying, um, I, th- I think there was the uh, Chilicotl, um albopilosum, the, the curly hair tarantula. They were buying, you know, a, I don't even think it was sexed. Like they just, it was just an adult curly hair tarantula. They bought it, they brought it home. A month later, it has an egg sac that's like fertile. It has spider legs yeah. in it. And they're just like, you know, so it, it's very odd. Like a, somebody that is captive breeding tarantulas isn't going to breed a tarantula and then sell it to you before it drops an egg sac, you know, that's, that takes that's that's their livelihood so it was painfully obvious that this was wild caught and so it wasn't just the fact that they took a tarantula out of the wild that didn't need to be taken but they also took hundreds of you know potential spiderlings that would have been you know raised in the wild and, and now they're in captivity and and usually the people that end up with those are you know that's like their first or second tarantula they have no idea how to care for an egg sac or raise spiderlings and and then if they did, what are they going to do with hundreds of curly hair tarantulas? You know, it's, it's a lot to, to put onto somebody, um, you know, so it's not so much worried about parasites. I, I think, I mean, when there, there is that issue, but I think at the tarantula hobby, at least it's, it's what's sad is when something like that happens. Like when you know that that wasn't just one tarantula that was removed, that was potentially hundreds of tarantulas that were removed from that area needlessly, you know, which is kind of frustrating. I, I agree. I actually, I, it's funny cause I heard that story. I, every species has its own or every group of species rather has its own concerns. And I just feel like pulling from the wild, you know, uh, look, you can go to an expo. Okay. And you can ask the person questions or whatnot. Usually after the, usually after the first couple of minutes, you can call BS if they are selling something as captive bred when it's actually wild caught. And then they, yeah. usually it's price because when you go to the tables where there'll be a vendor that's just selling dart frogs, you, you know, you might have certain species really aren't that expensive. Like a lot of the tinctorious locales really aren't that pricey. I mean, you can get an Azurius for like, you know, like frog of maybe 40 bucks, maybe a little bit cheaper, but some of the, you know, I don't, I hate using the term higher end because I don't believe you can, uh, an animal can be high end, you know, but if you're looking for a species like, like Promilio is a good example, frog of Promilio, they're, um, they become more popular within the past couple of years and they're challenging, you know, and they also have some pretty unique coloration depending on the locale. Yeah. I mean, I've seen captive bred with fog and familiar. They, they, they go up into the triple digits, oh, wow. you know, and if you see someone at a table who's selling them for 50 bucks, you know, you're getting wild caught. I mean, they can say whatever they want, but like, see, that's one of the things that people have to make a distinction between is the di- distinction between a breeder and a dealer. All right. Very true. A breeder is someone who works with an animal exclusively. They produce, you know, whether it's spawn in the case of amphibians or a clutch in the face in the case of like arachnids, they're producing those animals. But a lot of times they don't have the ability to sell those things. So they'll, you know, they'll sell them at wholesale to a dealer who will, you know, sell them however. Uh, I mean, look, me personally, I don't, I believe in buying from breeders. 
I believe in going, you know, if you want a good apple, go to the tree. Don't go to the bottom of the barrel. And there's plenty of good people out there. So, you know, you can, you, you get good at it after a while. You go to enough expo, don't go to an expo to buy, go to an expo to shop, look around, ask questions. And you want to get from a good vendor because if you see something that looks too good to be true, it, it generally is. Yeah. So, I mean, I've made that mistake before. Where I've, I've bought frogs that I thought were, I was like, oh, great, this is a steal. And they didn't end up doing as well as I thought they would. And I ended up putting a tremendous amount of, and look, that's part of the hobby too. You have to expect to put money into this. If your animals get sick, you're obligated to take care of them. A $30, you know, Dendrobates erratus, which is like a really common frog. I guess you consider it like, you know, you could consider it the eight cow of, of the dart frog hobby. It's life still has the same value as a $5,000, you know, like Pamilio. Yeah. So, you know, you, you got to consider that too is, you know, don't, you know, don't go cheap, you know, go to the right people. Yeah. That's, that's actually an argument I get in with people a lot online because, uh, it, like I have a, a, on my website, a list of like what I consider reputable dealers and not saying that if you're not on that list, you're not a reputable dealer. It's just, these are people that I know personally, uh, I've done business with, um, you know, I've met, uh, it, it, they're people that I trust and it's, I, I get a lot of flack because, um, people are like, well, they're, they're also the most expensive. <laughs> it's like, you know, you can go to this person online or this person and, and they're selling them for like two thirds the price. Or I can go to an expo and get this tarantula. They're caught, they're charging a hundred dollars for, for 40 bucks. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I don't know that person, you know, like, and I don't know where they came from. And you know, a lot of times if you go to the breeder, if it's just a small breeder, you can buy the, the, the spiderling a lot cheaper. Uh, but they only have like three or four different species available. And, you know, for the most part, at least in the tarantula hobby, uh, the majority of the breeders sell to the vendors, you know, and a lot of the vendors are doing breeding themselves. You know, there's like, I don't know, maybe like 10, um, kind of big businesses, I guess you could say like tarantula dealers and they breed themselves, but then they also buy wholesale from their friends that are doing breeding. Like I, I just bred my, uh, chilocotl. I always mispronounce that chilocotl. I, I don't speak Mayan or whatever language they, they oh, change that Brocky Bellman to, but I just, uh, I bred them and people are art. Like I posted a picture of them breeding um, and people are like, Oh, I want to buy one. And it's like, well, I'm not going to sell them. Like that's not the business that I'm in. I'm going to sell them wholesale to uh, a tarantula dealer. And then they can, they, cause they're, they're set up, they're equipped. They have the arrangements with FedEx and, and get the discounted shipping and they have the boxes and the heat packs and all that stuff. Like that's not something that that's not a business I want to go into. So I, I'm going to sell them wholesale to somebody that can do that, you know, and, and, if you're going to go to somebody that is, they know how to take care of these tarantulas when they have thousands of them and are going to package them well and, you know, do everything that needs to be done and, and like ensure the shipment and give you a live arrival guarantee, then yeah, you're, you're going to end up paying a little bit more than if you just bought it off some random guy at a reptile expo that has it labeled as like, Oh, it was, a, I was at a small reptile show. Uh, there may have been like 10 dealers there. Like it was, it was small and the guy was selling, I think mainly what he had was ball pythons. And then he had these little deli cups at the end of his table that just said, um, ornamental baboons. And oh, I was God. like, what is that? Like what's in there? I couldn't <laughs> see. It was all web webbed up. He opened it up. How are there now? Granted, they were all, <laughs> they were all labeled ornamental baboons. Half of them were OBTs. The other half were, uh, H max. So it was like, there was orange, ba orange baboon, like the Pteranoculus moranus. And then the, the H max. So I was like, those are completely different tarantulas. Like one's bright orange, one's black and white. And you have, you're selling them. And, and not only that, but he just opened up the lid and is just holding it there at me. And I'm like, dude, that is a, a very venomous and defensive and fast tarantula. You shouldn't just open up the lid and point it at people. <laughs> you know? So I was like, I'm not buying anything from you, even though those are really cheap and a good deal. Like uh, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so I, uh, you it's, it's uh, evidently had some pretty crappy care the entire time it's been with you. I think that a lot of people fall into that trap and generally what, uh, all right. Uh, every mistake should, is a, is a potential learning moment. And a lot of times what happens is that people will go to an expo and they'll buy from a distributor who really doesn't have a tremendous amount of experience dealing with that particular species. I mean, you might have a, you know, a, no disrespect to ball python people, but you might have a ball python guy. Hey, listen, my friend had a whole bunch of um, froglets hat hatch out. He had a whole bunch of like look millis hatch, you know, froglets hatch out. All right, do you want to, you know, well, they don't really hatch out, I should say, they morph out. But, um, you know, 
you want to bring them to the expo and sell them? The guy's like, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, you don't really know the care of that species. So, you know, someone who comes and buys them, you know, at the end of the day, look, that, that guy's gone. You know, he doesn't have a working relationship with the frogs. He's just reselling yeah. them for a friend. And look, I understand people do that. And there are people who, who dabble in both worlds and that's cool. But, you know, at the end of the day, that, that, that dude's gone. So if you're dealing with someone reputable, you, ha- you can have that relationship when you having a problem with this, with this, I mean, I've had breeders where I like, look, Hey, listen, you know, I got this frog. I'm having a little bit of a problem. Can you, you know, give me a little advice? Yeah, sure. Why don't you try this, separate these two, put them, you know, put this one on paper towels for a while, get a fecal. And that's the support that you're going to want. So a lot of people go into the hobby. They buy that cheap wild caught frog from the vendor who doesn't have a lot of experience, can answer a lot of questions. And oftentimes a frog dies. So what happens is, all right, that person's either going to get discouraged, abandon the hobby, not do it again. Or they're going to keep buying those cheap frogs from that person, just kind of perpetuating that cycle as they die along the way, or they're going to graduate and they're going to go to a reputable person because there's no shortage of reputable people out there working with dark frogs. There's, if you look, you'll find it. And a lot of, I've had a lot of reputable people on my show. I know I'm I'm not, this isn't to be like a name dropping session or anything like that, but you know, if you listen to the show, I've had a lot of breeders on a lot of people with, with a substantial amount of experience and, if someone can go on and on and on about their frogs, about their lines and whatnot, and just share this information with you, that's generally the person that you're going to want to deal with. So, but it's just like you said, you know, I mean, you, you know, dude's got, you know, a whole bunch of uh, same way. Dude's got a whole bunch of, you know, uh, you know, tarantulas out in, in vials, you know, slings and whatnot. And they have like one deli cup with, um, you know, like a great tree frog or something like that. I mean, it's like, well, what are you doing with that? You know what I mean? It, go, it goes, it goes both ways. Definitely. So. Yeah. And that's one thing, uh, like I'm a cheapskate. I like saving money anywhere I can clipping coupons, using discount codes, buying used, you know, there, there's, uh, I like my cork bark and substrate and all that kind of stuff. I always buy it when it's on sale and, you know, try to buy it uh, wholesale if I can and buy in bulk. Uh, but when it comes to living animals, like, I'm not trying to buy the cheapest one out there. Like in my experience, at least that's that usually it doesn't end well. You know, if I'm buying the, the cheapest tarantula that's available, there's probably there's something shady or something wrong with that. You know, it's I'm not saying go out and buy the most expensive one, but it's, you don't have to do a lot of uh, looking around to kind of figure out what the fair market price is for, uh, you know, whatever species that you're looking for, whether it's a tarantula or, or a snake or, you know, it's, it, it if, if, if you can figure out what that, that market price is and somebody's selling way underneath that and they don't know anything about it, like, yeah, maybe you're getting a once in a lifetime deal or something, but you also might be buying something that's sick or infested or just hasn't been cared for and it's stressed out and it's going to end up costing you more money in the long run when you're talking about, you know, just all the supplements and vet bills and everything else that's, you know, that has to go into it. Uh, speaking of like just the cost when it comes to, to dart frogs, are they required to be in bioactive setups or can you, I mean, how do you, how do you keep them successful? All right. Um, I promised I wouldn't get into bioactive. Oh man, I did it again, didn't I? <laughs> All right. Um, how do I put this tactfully? Um, we don't use that. T- it's a dirty word in the dark fog, in the dark fog community. Oh, that's um, interesting. Well, uh, to answer, I mean, to answer your question, yes and no. Okay. Um, the easiest way to keep dart frogs is, you know, you want to have an environment that's going to be relatively humid, but at the same time, you're not going to want all the garbage that goes along with it. So, I mean, yes, you could keep dart frogs on a substrate that would be, um, you know, disposable. I wouldn't recommend it though, because it's actually easier this way. So one of the problems that you run into with, with dart frogs is, is a lot of times people tend to keep the substrate overly moist. Okay. Which is not, you know, necessarily the case. They, they need high humidity, but you don't need the substrate to, to be sopping wet. In fact, you'll get health problems with that in certain species like uh phylobates species. They'll get foot rot if the substrate's too moist. Okay. But the issue with a moist substrate is, you're going to get a lot of baddies. You get a lot of stuff that you don't want in there, like forward flies. Forward flies are, uh, all right. I work, I work with sewage for, for, for 16 years. Okay. And I've seen everything. I've seen drain flies, forward flies. 
they love moist, like just kind of like gross environments and you don't want them. So the reason you want to introduce, to introduce a cleanup crew is basically to keep you from having to change that substrate constantly. So they're out competing those forward flies. They're out competing, um, you know, they're, they're eating off a lot of the mold and stuff like that that you really wouldn't want to have, you know, grow because it's unsightly, et cetera. And they serve as, they also serve as a secondary feeder source. So if you're going to have microfauna, I mean, what they, the, the, the term that p- people use a bioactive, I mean, it, it's, it's taken off in such a way that I feel like it's lost a lot of its meaning. And, and I, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to, you know, come off as like, uh, you know, um, a dick about that, but um, <laughs> it has its places. And I think that a lot of people really don't quite get the principle behind it is that you want to have an ecosystem that's going to be as self-sustaining as possible, but it's not going to be completely self-sustaining. So okay. y- you want to measure the, the the footprint of the animal to the enclosure. Meaning if I keep, uh, if I keep a larger frog, in, I mean, like, I don't know if you guys can see, but like, you know, these are 40 breeders behind me that have one frog. in them. Okay. Oh, wow. Now I don't have to do a tremendous amount of maintenance on that because I have a well-established cleanup crew and the, the environment is big enough to handle it. So if I keep that frog in a smaller, a smaller uh, enclosure, like a 15, 20 or a 10, the waste is going to build up no matter how many springtails you put in there, how many isopods. You're going to have to change a substrate. You have to change a leaf litter. It's just part of it. But you know, do you need to keep them like that? No, it just makes a life a lot easier because they have a readily, they have a readily uh, available food, secondary food supply. Uh, most of them really won't eat the isopods. Um, even the dwarf whites, I've never, with my, except for my, my bigger ones, my phyla babies, they probably eat them. But um and the springtails are important because, you know, they, they do a good job with waste control, but they don't, um, they don't get rid of everything, you know, but they, they kind of inhibit the mold growth and whatnot. But, you know, you, you don't need to have a, a bioactive setup like per se, but it, it makes it easier because you, you're kind of duplicating as closely as what you can to what the animals would, would somewhat live in. But, you know, it doesn't need to be, you don't need to have elaborate plants, you know, there are some people out there who really have have like really have a green thumb, but I mean, I cheat. I use pothos, which is like pothos will grow in like you know, it'll grow in like a, a you know a, a a bucket of dry dirt. I have yeah. pothos growing in nothing but water. Um, it's easy. It adds you know it, it adds to the, maintain the relative humidity. Um, it helps with some of you know some of the gas exchange, and it just it makes maintaining a, a humid environment easy. It's like, I know that, you know, the idea of adding a microphone, it's like fossorial moisture dependent species, like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a good one. What's the, what's the scientific name for, for cobalt blues now? Is it C. lividum or lividus? I think, oh, gee, you asked me to, I think it's C. lividus now. All right. I couldn't see in the but like people want to add, um, you know, they want to add microfauna, like springtails or whatnot to that type of setup, which I, I guess could work, but you know, your, ta- your tarantula isn't producing as much waste as, as say a frog would, because the, I mean, these things, they, they poop a lot and you know, it's, it's a fair amount of waste. So your micro, your, your cleanup crew really has its job cut out for itself, you know, and you're going to want to provide enough of an area that think of it like a food pyramid. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going off on a tangent, but um, you know, you have an apex predator at the top, say, you know, like a wolf, you have, um, you know, a, uh, uh, herbivores, you know, say, say it takes a hundred deer to keep one wolf alive over five years. Well, that hundred deer is going to say might need, you know, 10,000 acres to keep them alive. It's the same thing. You know, you're going to need enough space for your microfauna to survive and clean the tank effectively. So having a small bioactive, or you want to call it enclosure, isn't necessarily going to function, you know, unless you size the animal accordingly to it. So with tarantulas, it works great because they don't really produce much waste. I mean, yeah. I wipe the glass off of my, um, like my, 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 uh, my Armenia, I wipe the glass off maybe like once every six months. So it's really not a tremendous amount of waste, but with frogs, especially dark frogs, yeah, they can produce amount of, a lot of, a lot of waste. So if you are going to keep them with what people would call bioactive, it, it makes life easier for you. You're not going to be changing substrate as often. And it's just going to be, it's, it's in this case, it's better for the animals. I wouldn't use that 
line of keeping for other animals. I know people choose to do it and I willingly do it for my frogs because that's what's best for them. But I don't do it with my arachnids because I, number one, I don't keep moisture dependent species. Yeah. And if you dump a bunch of springtails into a dry enclosure, they're going to hang around the water bowl until it evaporates and they're going to die. So it's, it's, you know, it works in some situations and not in others. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go off topic. I could just, <laughs> I apologize. I'm, I'm not trying to be a, you know, um, you know, like come off as arrogant or anything like that. It's just, we have, we just, we have a different approach to it is all. And I, you know, yeah. apologize if I came off with tad harsh. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that's worth discussing because I mean, right now in the tarantula hobby, uh, everybody wants to keep everything bioactive because it looks cool. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it, 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 you know, it, it is a, it makes it a lot more visually appealing to look into an enclosure that has live plants and is lit well and, you know, kind of has that whole ecosystem. But like you said, there's, there's maybe like, uh, I have come, some of my snakes are in bioactive, but they poop a lot and, you know, they, they shed and there's, you know, there's, there's reasons for that, uh, for yeah. some of the species, but, and, and I even have a few tarantulas and bioactive enclosures, not, mm -hmm. not because I want the cleaning crew so much. It's more, uh, like Theraphosa species. They're, they're very moisture dependent. You know, the older they get, the larger they get, the more important that is because, uh, they can have some serious issues molting if, you know, it's too dry in the enclosure. So keeping it, keeping that moisture, you know, in the substance like that can lead to, you know, just mushroom growth and, and things like that that are a pain to deal with. So if I keep it bioactive, for the most part, the isopods and springtails clean all that up so I don't have to worry about mushrooms and mold. But when you got people trying to keep a fauna penalty like calcodes or green bottle blues or, you know, like these arid species in a bioactive, it's like they don't need it. Like it, it I understand that the desire to want to have a bioactive, but for, I mean, first and foremost, the tarantulas are nocturnal. They, they don't, they're very photosensitive. So if you got a bright light shining that enclosure for 10, 12 hours a day, yes. you're not going to see that tarantula more than likely during those 10 or 12 hours. Like it's going to stress them out and they're going to burrow and hide from that and come on out only at night. You know, where if you keep them in just like the ambient room lighting, you, you know, you're going to have a much better, a much better chance. I, I, I've been watching some people on YouTube that have been keeping dart frogs. And I think maybe that's where some of my misconceptions came from because I see that they are one, keeping them communally and, you know, they're, they're they're like they're big on the bioactive kind of setups and they're not like dart frog youtubers or anything you know more the the pet tubers that <laughs> go out there and get a whole bunch of uh a whole bunch of different species and they're like yeah i'm gonna uh, and i'm not gonna call anybody out on name um but you know there's there's hundreds of them on on youtube right now so i see that they're keeping those dart frogs communally and in bioactive so i just kind of assumed that maybe that was the standard and and actually there's been at least two people that have been on the podcast that have credited the dart frog hobby like that that community for even for bringing bioactive setups you know to a lot of other hobbies like uh i, I think it was rust from aquarimax the first one that mentioned dart frogs because he was like he had never considered or knew he didn't know how to keep any um amphibians or reptiles or anything bioactively until he started researching dart frogs and got into that whole hobby and and they were the ones that were like the leaders in, in bioactive enclosures. Well, I mean, I always, sorry, my, my dog is like right here and he's like, <laughs> he's like breathing into the microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry if it's this, you hear grunting. Um, I just assumed that was you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, there's a distinction between um, what you would, I guess, consider a naturalistic vivarium and what people would consider a bioactive vivarium. Now, a naturalistic vivarium is essentially you want to recreate a biome. And that the biome is, that's big with like aquarists. A good example is a black water tank. Like if you keep a Amazon species, and I'm not an aquarist, so if I'm wrong, anyone out there, please correct me. But yeah. uh, you'll have a certain biome that you want to duplicate that animal's natural environment as closely as possible. And I'm not opposed to people recreating an animal's natural environment by any means at all. I think that that's a great thing, but you know, like when it's done appropriately. So, I mean, bear in mind, there are people out there who do some really spectacular vivarium builds. They have some really great insights in terms of plants and whatnot, but the, the, I guess you could say the gold standard for what people would consider bioactive is based on the dark frog setup. Now, the interesting thing about that is that's not necessarily appropriate to every situation. 
Now, let's think about the components that go into the average vivarium build for a dart frog and what people kind of consider as a template for a bioactive enclosure. All right, well, you've got a drainage layer. You've got some kind of a substrate barrier, and then you've got a substrate, and then generally some sort of hardscape. You've got microfauna um, in there, you know, kind of assist as a cleanup crew. Well, the drainage layer for dart frogs actually serves a very different purpose, you know, from what you'd think. You want, like I said, they don't, remember how for a while people thought that certain species of tarantula had to be kept a certain way because they were from a certain place, meaning um, like a vicularia, they, they, people kept them in these like stifling conditions and they didn't do particularly well because that wasn't actually what it was like. Yeah. So with dart frogs, you don't want their substrate to be soaking wet. You want areas that are moist that they can go to, but you don't want them walking around in the swamp. So that drainage layer basically serves as that for a drainage layer, but that's also contingent upon your substrate. Now, if you're just putting topsoil on that or cocoa or uh, eco worth of cocoa fiber, that's going to maintain a lot of that moisture and that's not going to make its way through that substrate barrier into that drainage layer. So you have to choose your substrate accordingly. So a lot of us use what they call ABG mix, which was developed by the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. It's essentially a combination of like sphagnum moss, uh, some pea products, tree fern fiber, and uh, charcoal. So what happens is the substrate, it drains very, very easily down into the drainage layer, which acts as a reservoir to maintain that, you know, maintain that humidity once it comes back. Mm -hmm. So I think what a lot of people kind of have the misconception is that, you know, if you're going to create what you would consider a bioactive enclosure for a different species that you need all those elements. I mean, I've seen people use drainage layers for fossorial species of tarantulas. And I just think to myself, well, you now you're inhibiting that animal's ability to engage its natural behavior. And that was your intention in the beginning was to create an environment where it could behave as naturally as possible. But now you're eliminating its ability to burrow by putting, you know, a layer of leek or clay balls or whatever down below, which we don't serve the practical purpose because you don't want to flood this thing's burrow anyway. But that's just, you know, I, I see no harm in providing a naturalistic a naturalistic environment for animals, but I just don't think that the principles established by the dark frogs community are applicable to every situation. I think that's the big misnomer that's out there is that people associate that 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 buzzword with a certain matter of keeping, which is not necessarily appropriate for every species. Like, I don't keep my blood pythons on. I keep them on craft paper and newspaper because number one, these things crap once a year and it's gigantic. And there's no way that an army of springtails and ice pods is going to be able to clean up that mess. So I keep them in a manner that is not necessarily a hundred percent natural. It's not even close to being natural, yeah. but they're healthy. They eat, they grow, they do well. I'm able to maintain the parameters that are, within the range that that species would appreciate because I've based that on what I've learned from other blood python keepers. So you can't apply a one size fits all situation to every, you know, to every case. And I, I, it's funny because I'll go on, I'm not, I'm not really big on dendro boards. I, I it's nothing against dendro boards. It's just that there's a lot of like pop-ups on the site and I might have kind of, you know, problems with the pop-ups and everything like that, but I'm, I'm fairly active on, on, uh, uh, arachno boards actually and there's actually a lot of you know froggers who keep tarantulas and there's, there's a couple of us out there and this is one person oh, i can't remember this person's name but i don't even know if it's he or she but this person's got a really great natural set naturalistic setup for um, an agent niculata and this setup is choice it's perfect but it was well thought out and well planned Ah oh, man, I can't remember this person. I don't want to call anybody out by name, but that's an example of when you can pull it off. Like with an Aegyniculata, you can pull it off. But with another species, like, you know, um, like you said, um, like like GBBs, you know, um, you can't pull that off because it's not going to accomplish the intended purpose. So you're not serving that animal's needs by trying to fit it into a template just because you think that that's where it goes, you know? I don't know. I guess my rant. I mean, when it comes to bio by technically i guess technically bioactive enclosures uh for tarantulas the only ones that i have um i guess like i said for my theraphosa species 
And that's more of an experiment than anything. I'm just seeing how well this works. Uh, and then I just did a, uh, a paludarium, a bioactive setup for a carabiner versicolor. Uh, cause they do like, you know, it's got good airflow, but it also has good humidity. Um, but even when I, I did that and I, and I made a video on it, I was sure to like, and I actually just released another video setting up another enclosure for a carabiner versicolor to be like, they don't need bioactive. Like that, that is not, I am in no way trying to stay, say this is the standard of keeping them because I don't even know if it's going to do well. This is an experiment, you know, because it's like, it could do really well being in that type of environment or, you know. It's a lot more work, definitely, than just keeping it in a acrylic enclosure with substrate, a large water dish, and some fake plants just for looks. Like that's much easier to do. It's just as happy, uh, and I think uh, uh, at least in the tarantula hobby, a lot of people get caught up in in doing the bioactives just because it it looks cool or it makes them seem more experienced uh, than maybe they actually are. Uh, There's like it's just something people can hang their hat on. Like, well, I keep all my tarantulas bioactive, and it's like. You think that makes you sound cool, but that it's actually uh, kind of like waving a flag. Like, I don't know what I'm doing because <laughs> it's like, they don't need it. They, you know, a lot of these are desert species or they're, they're in scrublands and, you know, they're not going to benefit from a high humidity, damp environment that the plants are going to need, you know, uh, not to mention the lights. Um, I mean, it is fun. I understand that aspect, but I get so much hell from people that I don't even know who they are. Like just random people that leave comments on on posts and videos that are, they hate plastic plants and they're like, quit using plastic plants. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like I, I find them to be uh, like, you know, I, I like the way they look. I mean, some of them are pretty cheesy looking, but I don't think the tarantula knows the difference really between a live plant or it's just something for them to, to use as a web anchor, you know, like it, it, I don't think they care. And you know, it, it, it's not worth all the extra effort to keep a live plant growing. Like the reason I got into tarantulas instead of reptiles or amphibians is because the low maintenance, like they're so, it, it, the, just the husbandry of them is, is inexpensive and not time consuming. So when you get into bioactives, like it's, it's getting expensive and time consuming very quickly. Um, but I mean, that's just, I probably just upset half the tarantula community saying that. So <laughs> if I get canceled, it's been nice talking to you. I don't, <laughs> I, I buried you. Look, <laughs> I don't, I don't believe that hostility accomplishes anything productive. I don't seek out people to, I don't believe in reaching for low hanging fruit. I, I'm not going to get in an argument with someone that I know is wrong because why do I have to prove myself to them? I don't do that. I don't even like to argue with people, but you know, th there's oftentimes where something gets lost and people will use, you know, the, the, the B word to kind of put themselves off as being a better keeper. And like, look, Growing plants in a box doesn't necessarily make you a better keeper. Yeah. You don't have to do that. In fact, you know, like when I'm, when I go on arachnid boards, you know, there's me and there's like maybe like three or four other people out there who keep dark frogs as well. And every so often some new, you know, beginner will come out and say, I want to go bioactive. And I said, well, first of all, what species are you keeping? And I'm not even, I'm just talking about tarantula. What species are you keeping? Oh, well, I'm, I just got a, uh, you know, a B. albopelosa. I will right, well, first of all master the care for that. It's simply, you know, I mean, it's it's you know, you don't need to provide this. It just needs what you know what a tarantula needs. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have, you know, I've seen that, and honestly, like we actually discourage people from doing it because it to, to me it's not practical. I have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I've got about twenty enclosures that you could consider to be like I guess what people would call bioactive. Yeah, and you know, if you can master plant growth and you can understand the natural history of the animal you're keeping, it, it makes it easier. I think that a lot of people kind of overthink it. I mean, there's, look, there's, there's nothing that hard about throwing a pothos, in, you know, in a glass box and putting something in there with it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, it, when you get into a situation where it's contrary to the animal's natural history, that's when I would take issue with it. Or when that becomes more important than the animal that you're taking care of. And building a great show of aviarium is wonderful. It's impressive. And I encourage people to learn how to do it. But master the, the animal that you're caring for. Master that animal's basic husbandry needs first before you try to go into advanced. And then you have a problem. And that's where I see people typically have problems with arachnids is because it's a fairly new concept. You know, and again, me and the other keepers that, you know, like talk to an arachnid board, none of us keep our spiders in what you would consider to be a bioactive uh, you know, you know, um, 
uh, type of uh, setup. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say a good 90, 95% of my collection is, is not bioactive or, I mean, it's, it's just substrate and fake plants. And it, I always get a kick out of, uh, like, cause a lot of them, a lot of the species I keep, you know, they're from the scrublands and deserts. And, you know, so I'll, I'll get a, uh, a fake succulent from like the pet store or the hobby shop or something like that. And I'll throw it in there and I get all these comments, like what species of, of succulent is that? It looks beautiful. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. It's plastic. <laughs> like it's, you can't tell the difference. So, you know, why am I going to try and, and keep a plant alive when the plastic ones in a lot of cases <laughs> look just as good? Uh, and, and I think, like, I try. Like, I mean, I've been on arachnoboards for quite a while, but I don't interact a whole lot, especially now. Uh, but back then, like, it, it, and it's nothing against the people on there or anything like that. It's just the, um, like, the interface, just message boards in general like that, like uh, arachnoboards, tarantula forums. Uh, however my brain works, I just have a hard time retaining information from that type of, of thread. Like, I get confused or... You know what I mean? Like somebody's responding to something that was said, you know, five or six comments up in the thread and like that. It was similar with Reddit. Like for, for whatever reason, my brain just has a hard time processing that information. So I don't spend a whole lot of time on there. But uh, and it's probably why a lot of people uh, on Facebook and places like that are constantly complaining about arachnoboards because <laughs> they go in there saying they want to keep something bioactive and people are very, you know, blunt and to the point like, no, that's stupid. Don't do that. And then their feelings get hurt. And <laughs> they're like, arachnoboard sucks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, everyone has their open. It's 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 funny that you say that because I actually figured that um, I actually found arachnoboards to be the more tolerant of the forums that are out there. <laughs> but I get I, I have no social media presence. I don't, you know, it's just not who I am. I, I moved away from all that, you know, a couple of years ago. But yeah, you know, it, 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 look, I'm wrong sometimes. I'm wrong a lot of the times, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that, look, you know, I don't know everything, you know, there are people that who are younger than me that can teach me things. You know, I don't, the, the problem is when you get into people who are, they automatically go into a conversation with an adversarial expectation of the outcome. You know, you know, it's like going into a room with, I, I don't know, like going into a room with like a rhinoceros and saying like, oh, I'm going to keep this in my house. Like, what are you nuts? Like, no, no, it's okay. I saw it on National Geographic. Like, what? Yeah. You know, it's just people create these absurd situations and they expect people to side with them, you know, and completely abandon reason. And and that's what that's what bothers me. You know, it's like people will come in. You know, look, I, I understand it's difficult to to understand like someone's tone of voice, and sometimes people come off as being hostile. But there are delicate ways to tell people that they are wrong. You know, and and most people nowadays don't seem to be able to take that criticism with the grain of soul, you know, and that's, that's that I take issue with. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's really difficult to try and, and interact with people on whatever social media, if, if you disagree with them, because it, it immediately turns into an argument. Uh, and, and a lot of times it's not, I just ignore those comments. Like if I, if I make a video and somebody is leaving some very, um, you know, just, like I'll, I'll accept your criticism, but I'm not going to sit here and argue with you in the comments. Like I, I did that for many years, like argument politics and religion. And I mean, yeah. whatever you make a post and, and I don't, I, it, sometimes I could even agree with you. It was just like, it was fun to play devil's advocate and, and argue. I mean, I still, I guess I still do that. Cause my wife <laughs> gets mad at me cause she'll say something and I'm arguing. She's like, you don't even care. Like why, why don't you, why are you arguing with me? And I'm like, that's a good point. <laughs> Like, uh, I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm just taking the other side to have a discussion. And, um, you know, so it's like I've I tried to cut that out of uh, my interactions online, especially now. And um, it, and when I see it, I, I, I understand why people are, you know, trolling or, uh, you know, arguing with people online. Uh, but I think as, much, as many trolls as there are out there, I think there's as many or even more people that are just extremely sensitive and if you don't agree with them and support whatever comment it is they say to them, how crazy it is, <laughs> they they automatically assume that you're just trying to 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 you know marginalize them or uh, you know tell them they're stupid or you know whatever. Uh, so it, it it really has turned. And I don't know how it is in the the dart frog community, but there's a good portion of the tarantula community that just assumes arachnoboards, Facebook groups, 
Uh, all of those are just very toxic environments where you, you're not going to learn anything. You're just going to get shit on and insulted. Uh, and anytime I say that, people are like, oh, well, you don't know anything about the snake hobby or the reptile hobby or the amphibian hobby. It's so much worse there. <laughs> but I, I don't know it, if that's true or not. You know, if you look for negative things, you're going to find negative things. And, you know, there's always going to be someone who disagrees with you. And whether that person is right or wrong, whether you're right or wrong, is really, you know, immaterial. It's really more about how you handle yourself. And, you know, there have been points where I've gotten into, sorry, I'm like petting my dog here. <laughs> um, there have been times where I've gotten into arguments with people who have criticized me for things that I've said that they didn't hear the entire thing in context. And it's very, very easy for someone to make a nasty or negative, con uh, negative uh, you know, con uh, comment, you know, just out of just knee-jerk reaction. And it's like, look, I, I don't have time to argue with you about this. Look, if you feel that adam adamantly about this, fine, go ahead. I don't really, you know, I care, but I don't care enough to actually lend it lip service. Yeah. You know, it's like, I was, you know, I, I don't want, I don't want to make this a referendum about message boards and whatnot, but you know, I was following a thread and you, you know, you kind of reach a point where you're doing something. You think, you know what? Like, I, I think I'm just going to like walk away. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I don't walk away, you know, you can, you can see the people with the, you know, with the popcorn waiting for the dumpster fire to start. Yeah. And I started getting into this conversation with someone and, um, it got a little heated. And then I realized like, you know what, like, look, uh, you know, I, I I'm, I'm not going to win this. Yeah. You know? I don't even want to win. You know, it's not an argument that I really want to be part of anymore. So I, I think that, what I've learned is despite the fact that I'm a completely <laughs> negative and miserable person, <laughs> is that, you know, you, you, if you want good information, you have to work to find it. If you want bad information, that stuff is everywhere, you know? So you have to find good people, you know, find people that you trust, find people who are willing to take criticism as well as give it. Yeah. And that's really apply to every hobby. I mean, the, 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 the crazy thing about the exotics hobbies is that look, you know, we're, we're like it or not, we're all in this together. You know, I mean, right now there's a lot of, I don't want to get, I don't want to get into, you know, the politics or legislation or anything like that. But right now there's a lot of legislation going on that's going to have some very, very profound effects on the exotics hobby as a whole and as individual communities. And the more we fight and malign each other and do stupid things, the more we're going to lose credibility and we're going to lose our rights to, you know, to, to, to have this hobby. And I think that all this infighting and stuff like, oh, like, you know, over, over like nonsense. It's like, look, you don't need, you know, you, 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 you know, bioactive is not the gold standard for every situation. And, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I mean, I've, I've came upon this myself. I had a, you know, going back, going back to like the, I want to say the early two thousands. Okay. Okay. I was using Cypress mulch as a substrate for most of my animals because I kept a lot of like, you know, moisture dependent animals. I kept a lot of salamanders, pixie frogs, et cetera. I used to keep blood pythons on that, but not anymore. And I had, um, I had a pixie and I looked in there one day. I'm like, there's always a like white bugs kind of just crawling on, you know, crawling and everything. And I'm like, sorry, my dog's knocking my headphones off again. Um, I'm like, what the hell are these things? And I was like, all right, first I pat them. Like, oh God, like maybe they're mites or some sort of parasites or something like that. And then I kind of watched what they were doing. And, you know, the pixies, when they defecate, it's pretty intense. So I found these little things were, were actually eating it. They were working on it. And I paid attention to a while. And like, they, they just, they did a good job of cleaning it up. You know, I started keeping animals that way just because I realized that it helped clean up the mess. And this is even before I was, was really actively keeping dog frogs. So, you know, it's not like, uh, like I've been doing this for so long. So to have people come out of the woodwork and tell me that you have to keep animals this way mm -hmm. is not necessarily true in every situation. I and mean, if you choose to do that, you can pull it off. That's fine. You know, I don't begrudge people that. But the thing is, when you come out with, you know, pitchforks blazing and you have to keep every animal a certain way, even when it's completely contradictory to that animal's natural history, you know, that's that to me is is dumb. And that's not something that I can get behind. And people are going to disagree with me. But you know what? Look. You're welcome to disagree with me. You know, these are opinions. This is why people talk, you know?
but yeah, that's why I try to, to really hammer home, let people know, like I'm, when I'm, I'm talking about a species and how I keep it, I'm just telling you how I do it. I'm sharing my experience. Uh, I'm not telling you that you must do it this way because, you know, I'm, I'm constantly learning how I'm keeping tarantulas and snakes now is a, a not how I was doing it five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Like it's constantly evolving and changing as we learn more and more about, you know, how these animals do in captivity. And there are a lot of different, a lot of different paths to the same, you know, destination. Like there's a lot of people that are able to keep their tarantula on, you know, one substrate and they're, they thrive, you know, it's not, maybe it's not the enclosure or type of substrate that I use, but that doesn't mean that either one of us are wrong. And uh, I think that maybe it's just because the world right now, because of social media is so, um, you know, tribal and, and it, it, it's really easy to kind of fall into that, you know, like the way I do it is, is a hundred percent correct. And anybody that disagrees with me is, is, is completely wrong. Like I got kicked out of a, uh, leopard gecko uh, Facebook group once because I asked a question about keeping them on a uh, bioactive, you know, like keeping a leopard gecko in an arid bioactive setup. And they're like, yeah, you're gone. And I'm like, you, you didn't even answer my question. Like you could have told me why that's a bad idea. Just not ban me from the group, you know, teach me uh, rather than just, uh, you know, because I disagree with your, your worldview uh, just completely shut me down. Um, and, and I think that's something we got to, because it's not just like you were saying earlier, it's not, I think from the tarantula hobby aspect, cause that's, that's really where the majority of my experience is, is we see people that are keeping dart frogs or uh, snakes or other reptiles and stuff like that. We see this legislation that's coming down and we're like, yeah, that's their problem. Like, like right now I'm wearing a U.S. arc shirt, not just because that was what was on top of the drawer when I, I got dressed this morning. It wasn't a political statement or anything, but it's, it's really hard to get people, um, in the tarantula hobby to support somebody like us Arc Cause they're like, Oh, they're just for reptile keepers. They're not going to help us. And it's like, well, it's, it's a, it's a slippery slope. You know, if they start regulating one exotic pet, then they're going to start regulating all of them. You know? So it's, it, we, we, even though we have different interests, we really should be working together, uh, and, you know, for the good of the hobby, I guess, for like all the, the entire hobby. I mean, we have universal concerns, you know, the, the, the concerns that go on in the, in the tarantula hobby, because I mean, look, I consider myself to be a frog hobbyist first. I consider myself to be a tarantula hobbyist second. But the concerns are the same. You know, when it comes to regulation and whatnot, I mean, it, it's got to start somewhere. But once you get your foot in the door, that leaves the door open for everything else to come in. And, you know, like what you said earlier about, I mean, the, the fact that the tea hobby has been able to go on as long as it has without a major, like, public image incident honestly amazing i mean that shocks me i mean listen someone le abandons up you know a uh you know a, a, a retic in a shopping mall parking lot that's on the news yeah you know what i mean now tell me what's going to happen when some kid gets tagged by a p regalis and that makes the news yeah. that's when it's going to get really bad so that's why you it, you know it behooves us as individuals to be responsible and to do the right thing and, you know, understand that like, look, you know, us arc does a tremendous amount for us that we don't even see, mm. you know, you look at that mailing list, you look at all those court cases that they get involved with. They do a tremendous amount of work. And in the amphibian community, we had some really major list legislation going back a few years ago um, with uh, salamanders. I think it was 201 species of salamanders listed on the injurious uh, listed by the you know federal regulations as, in, as injurious which essentially banned their import and um, transport uh, between states so basically what that did was the whole um, the whole salamander hobby basically got stymied now there are legit reasons behind this ban okay and, and this is not to become a pro or a con against the ban but there yeah. is you know Ironic that we're living in a human uh, in a, a pandemic now that affects human beings, and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. But um, <laughs> since about the '80s, there's been a, uh, a a pandemic that's been affecting amphibians. It's it's chytrid. Um, if you do a little research, look into chytrid. Uh, essentially, it's it's a it's a fungal infection that has devastated amphibian populations worldwide. And originally, it, it was it targeted frog species we lost a lot of species uh, a lot of individuals and certain members of species most likely to chytrid now i'm not the most informed source about the specifics of chytrid so if you are curious about it i encourage you to go 
you know, look at some scholarly articles and read some papers. But to give you the gist of it, um, chytrid may have spread across the world because of non-native species coming into contact with native species. And by that, I mean, um, it's theorized that species from Southeast Asia, possibly elsewhere, had, you know, this, this, this fungus, basically. Yeah. And somehow, some, somehow, somewhere, they, they like to pin it on um, the importation into, you know, the United States, et cetera. But in any event, um, it spread to a lot of vulnerable native populations. Um, the, uh, the Adelopis genus, uh, which are, they call them harlequin toads in uh, Central America, were like uh, devastated by it. So that gave fire to what happened next was a variant of not really a variant but of the uh, catcher it goes it goes by b cell it's got a long name which i can't pronounce at this moment but um b cell effectively devastated european fire salamander populations i mean devastated them so again it was theorized that salamanders and new species from southeast asia who had evolved with this fungus who didn't you know perish because of it um you know through the pet trade animal trafficking, whatever, made its way into Europe and just wreaked havoc. Okay, now what people don't realize is that the United States, especially the Southeast, has, I think it's the second highest biodiversity of caudates, salamander species in the world. And the rationale behind this ban was that they don't want anything coming in that's going to wipe out our native species because they'd essentially be sitting ducks. They'd be vulnerable to it. And we could lose a tremendous amount of native amphibian biomass due to this, you know, this pandemic, basically. So to make a, story, a long story short, you know, the, the injurious species list, it, it ended up U.S. Arc 4 to an extent. And they basically allowed, you know, captive breeding and res- like what you would consider, I guess, responsible trade. People are going to have different differences of opinion on this. I understand. I've heard both sides. I've heard conservationists and ecologists, and I've heard hobbyist sides. I, you know, the, not to plug my podcast, but the focus of my podcast has been to bridge the gap between those two worlds. Because if you have animosity between hobbyists and people who are doing the field work, that's not going to be good for the hobby at all. Yeah. So, you know, part of that ban, I understand, but, you know, U.S. ARC was able to iron out a lot of it. So now that, you know, legislation has changed in a way that it's more favorable and it doesn't penalize the responsible hobbyist who is engaging in, um, you know, captive breeding, captive bred programs and, and you know, normal interstate. I, I'm a big fan of regulation. You know, I believe that everything has to be regulated or otherwise we're just going to be completely, you know, we're going to go nuts and we're going to end up burying ourselves. So, you know, when legislation comes out, you have to understand the, the perspective that it's coming from, you know, but at the same time, I don't believe that people should be, you know, I don't believe that sweeping legislation should punish everyone who is able to keep their animals responsibly and ethically and legally. I don't believe that people like that should have to fall victim to this sweeping legislation that essentially is meant to punish you know someone else who's bringing this stuff in either illegally or under questionable circumstances but it's yeah. changed the landscape of the amphibian hobby and it's a it's a, a very very big topic and a big bone of contention with people so i'm not trying to open a can of worms with that but you know it, it's you think to, you think the t celadonia is a big deal yeah come down the amphibian rabbit hole for a while <laughs> okay yeah t celadonia is a big deal but that's one species think about hundreds of species you know yeah, we were talking about the, the that other species the brunepi's singa singa brunet whatever that is yeah <laughs> you I, know like that that's another species that's kind of but I, I think like we're lucky as tarantula keepers because it's not what is it not nearly as much attention and regulation is going on as it yeah. does with, you know, especially amphibians, um, yeah. you know, and then uh, there was a lot of, so I had, was talking to someone uh, about uh, like, I don't even know what, what it would be. You call it Aquarius or something like that. People that oh, they have aquariums. Yeah. Aquarium enthusiasts. Yeah. Like there's a lot of fish and stuff that they can't keep because you know, they've been banned and, you know, and it, and I agree. Like it's, it's not cut and dry, black and white. Like, um, you know, I, I was talking to somebody, Oh man, I wish I could remember who it was. Uh, one of the earlier podcasts, and they were saying like the people that are writing the legislation 
aren't even like really they're not the the keepers they're not the breeders or the dealers the vendors there's a lot of times they're not even the scientists or the researchers they're just uh, people that read some news articles and you know are yeah. politicians that are going to write up this legislation or they're a lobbyist for you know one organization or another that doesn't even really care about the animals so much and uh you know and, and that's where a lot of the problem with legislation comes from is that it's not like um it doesn't take from a lot of different pools and experience and opinions and stuff like that and create a comprehensive plan. It's just, uh, you know, one person and their idea and saying, we'll just shut all of this down and, and ban this one species and who cares about how, who it affects, you know? And so it's, I mean, but that's just, that's just politics. That's, that's just our country at the moment. It's, uh, I mean, you know, like I said earlier, you know, you get some eight year old kid, you know, mom, dad picks it up, you know, a pokey at an expo. And that spider tags that kid. I mean, you know, there's a video on YouTube of uh, what's his name, Rob C. Yeah. The guys, uh, 1976. He did a he did a YouTube video of, and he got tagged by a P. Regalis. He really, a, dude. And it 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 just it like you know it it kicked his ass. Oh yeah. So if you have a situation like that, I mean, heaven forbid that shouldn't happen to anyone. But if you have a situation like that, that's going to devastate the tarantula hobby. Mm. Because they're not going to be able to dis- make the distinction between, you know, P. regalis, which generally considered to be an advanced species in the tarantula community, from, you know, like a T. alba pelosum or, you know, a Brachypelma hammeri or something. You know, they're, they're, they're not going to make that distinction. And that's when you really, really get into trouble because the people who have the vested interest in it are not the ones that are spoken, to, you know, spoken for. But, you know, I would be remiss – you know, in, in my responsibilities, if I didn't hear both sides of that argument. So it's very, very easy to side with either the hobbyist or the scientists or the legislator or whatever. You, one person cannot get everything, you know, yeah. for both sides to not, you know, not to acknowledge each other. I think that's just childish. And I don't think that that's the way that we're going to move forward, you know, in, in an amicable, di- excuse me, in an amicable direction. Yeah. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. That you know, you try to engage someone on the other side; they're not going to be very reluctant. To, they're going to be very reluctant to talk to you if they talk yeah. to you at all. Yeah, I I tell people flat out: Look, you're welcome to come on my show. You can talk about whatever you want. You know, if you disagree with the hobby, I want to hear what you have to say because right. that's that's your right and that's part of this problem. Not not that it's a problem, as in I oppose these people, but you have to be upfront. And actually talk about this stuff in a way that's going to have a positive end. Because if we fight each other and stick our heads in the sand, one side's going to get what it wants. And it shouldn't be too much of one and it shouldn't be too much of the other. Because you know what? Look, I shouldn't have the right to have a rhinoceros in my basement. But at the same time, there are other species that I can maintain responsibly and successfully that I believe I have the right to keep as a responsible adult. I agree 100%. You know, and, and that's one of my biggest worries is – and, and it's even within just, just obvious, there's a, um, just, it, it's very divisive when we talk about anything like this, uh, like essentially being responsible keepers, uh, you know, you get some people that are really feel that, you know, the old world species, especially the more defensive and venomous ones, um, you know, maybe not be regulated, but you know, maybe the dealer should at least make sure you're over 18 before they sell it to you or get your parents permission, like sign some kind of waiver that says, I understand that this is very fast and very venomous. And, uh, you know, it can be very defensive if I don't treat it correctly. And then you got people on the other side that are saying, well, that stigmatizes old worlds as dangerous and that's bad. Like no tarantula is dangerous. <laughs> it's like, well, I, I know a tarantula is deadly. I'll give you that. But I think there are a lot of uh, tarantulas that can be dangerous, um, if not properly taken care of. And, I said it again. Like I keep saying, I'm not going to say that because every time I say that, <laughs> I get inundated with emails and comments from people that are saying I'm trying to destroy the tarantula hobby by using tarantula and dangerous in the same sentence. But it, that exact scenario that you're talking about is what I personally worry about. Uh, just because I have a kid in my house uh, who has a lot of friends and his friend's parents think I'm insane because I have a bunch of tarantulas in my basement. you know. And it's like I am working really hard to prove to these, you know, reason will be rational and well-educated adults that there's nothing to be worried about. Like, like they're all in their own enclosure and they're, they're safe and they're secure. And, you know, for the most part, they're all harmless. Uh, even if your kid were to get bit somehow, like it, it's not going to hurt them. 
And, uh, it, it, you know, there's, there's a few species. Uh, it's just, I worry that some kids somewhere on is going to try to be doing something for a TikTok video and end up getting bit and it's all over the news and, you know, it, it becomes this big stigma and, you know, anyone that keeps any trench is going to get painted by that brush. Like, well, they're dangerous, uh, because this one kid got bit and it went viral <laughs> and they were, I had to go to the hospital or something. So I think it's important to kind of educate and talk about it, uh, try to make people aware that. Um, you know, we should be responsible and we should be, you know, warning people uh, that there could be some painful consequences if you're not responsible. I mean, part of it is also just setting a good example, you know, in the greater community. Yeah. And, you know, bear in mind, frogs are for all intents and purposes, pretty innocuous. I mean, they generally are pretty, especially like white's tree frogs. They're, you know, they look like big fat little green babies and people like them. You know, they're not, they're not threatening. They don't have the same effect as a, as a snake or a spider would. It just seems to be the way people are ingrained, uh, ingrained rather. But, you know, the dart frogs, the first question I get is, oh, he's like, oh, are they poisonous? And I say, no, you know, and then I get, I, you know, but you have to do that talk. You can't get defensive and whatnot because then, you know, that person goes and leaves you, you know, you, they leave with a bad taste in the mouth because of the way that you spoke to them or the way that they thought you act that puts a bad perception out there. So, I mean, since COVID kind of stymied things, you know, I would, uh, you know, I, I mean, in my own pathetic way, I did some, you know, some community outreach. I did, um, I did a presentation at my kid's school where I brought in some frogs and, you know, just, you know, explained some of the natural history, you know, showed off some of the, I mean, you know, you're not going to get that wow effect where like, you know, the dude in like the big cowboy hat comes in and holding like, a big albino berm in his hands. You know what I mean? You're not going to get that, but you know, that wasn't my intention. You know, my intention is that this is not spectacle. I don't do this for attention. I do this because I enjoy it. I do it because I enjoy these living things. And I want you to be able to understand, you know, what they are, why they're here. And, you know, just what a joy it is to be around. Them. So, you know, it's like, that's also, I mean, that's gotta be much harder with the tea community because I mean, people hate spiders. You know, when I see kill it with fire, oh, I mean, yeah. how, does how does that affect you guys? Look better on the bottom of my boot. <laughs> I'm getting tired of reading that comment, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's part of the reason that I, I started a YouTube channel because I was like, I, I really want to showcase how beautiful these th and unique these and fascinating tarantulas can be try to remove that stigma because I mean, up until you know, recently it's kind of been an explosion of tarantula YouTube channels the past four or five years. But I mean, the, pretty much the only exposure most people had to them were, you know, like an Indiana Jones movies or, you know, stuff, stuff like that. Um, you know, old B horror movies where they're these horrible things that will eat you. And it's like, you know, maybe people aren't that superstitious or paranoid or, you know, they don't believe it, but they still, they think they're creepy and scary and dangerous and, uh, you know, if I can do my small part to kind of showcase that they're they're beautiful and, and interesting looking, you know, it might change a little bit of you know, some people's minds. Um, in fact, I had my kid uh, not this year because of COVID, but I think it was the year before. Yeah, it was his, it was in fifth grade. He did a science fair project on tarantulas. Essentially, I gave him like three or four different species. I think it was three. I can't remember now. It was either three or four, uh, but it was like a fossorial, a terrestrial. Uh, semi-arboreal and arboreal probably is what it was. And yeah, you know, they were juveniles. They're all new world. So you don't have to worry, but he ended up bringing them to a school, having them set up, you know, with their little, their little board with all their research and, and notes and stuff like that. And then, you know, three or four little enclosures with tarantulas in them. And initially his teachers were like freaked out. Like, no, you can't do that. You can't have spiders. You can't bring them. And I was, so I'd like talk to him for a little bit. And, you know, he, and he did most of the talk and he explained everything, showed him his reach. Like they're not, they're not harmful. They're not going to get out. And by the end of that experience, uh, like the school secretary is calling us because one of the tarantulas got stressed. And when they're stressed, they kind of pull their legs in, you know, kind of cover their eyes. And he was worried that it was a death curl. And so his like, his, one of his teachers or something is, uh, getting online and researching what a death curl is and it, and like, you know, visually, you know, comparing the photos from what they were watching online and being like, no, I think it's just stressed. And then she becomes fascinated by tarantulas. So it was like, so it can be infectious, you know, and once people just that small little bit of education, you know, that you can really kind of light a fire um, in somebody's mind and, and get them really fascinated by it and, and remove that fear. Well, that's, I mean, that's a great, that's a great story. So that's the stuff that I really like to hear because, you know, it, it's one thing to interact with someone through some sort of a media, you know, I mean, interacting with, I mean, when, when it's YouTube, 
you're not, you know, you're presenting something for public consumption. You know, you're not necessarily going to have a, a two way conversation with people. You're going to present something in such a way and people will view it and they'll take away from it what they will. But when you actually interact with someone person to person, I feel like you are able to capture something that is otherwise lost, especially when you're working with like with, with kids. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to explain, my kids kind of know that we don't live like, you know, most people do. I mean, not everybody has, you know, tanks full of frogs and, and spiders and whatnot. And, you know, that's cool. But like, you know, when their friends come over, I don't drag everything out and be like, like you, you have to like this. I understand that some of them don't like it. You know, like someone was asking me, I was, this was, uh, this was going back. I was taking an online class and I get, I, I don't want to be a jerk, but like, you know, sometimes younger people kind of think that like, um, they haven't become jaded yet. So this person asked how to get people to like reptiles. I have a coworker who hates reptiles. How do I get her to come along? And I said to this person, I said, you have to respect the fact that this person might not like these animals, no matter what you do. That's very true. So, you know, that you can't expect someone to love the same things that you do. You know, I don't like when my kids have friends over, I don't expect them to look at my tarantulas or my frogs in awe and excitement. I don't expect them to because I understand that they're they're human beings. They might not like it. Yeah. It's not inside your comfort zone. I'm not going to, you know, force it on. But what's nice is when you do get that reciprocation, when you do get that one person, whoever, whoever that person is, and you get that excitement, you know, that's what's, that's, what's nice. And I just, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, actually. Um, my kids, like I said, we, you know, we, we have, you know, we, we have our respect for living other living things and that's just the way that it is here. But, um, when my youngest was in, I think it was, she was in first grade, there was a spider in my classroom. I, we don't, I don't kill spiders in the house. I just don't, um, you know, I don't like true spiders to be honest with you, but we don't kill them. So yeah. there was a spider in her class and then all the kids were going nuts and, she gets up on, she stands on top of a desk and she says, somebody get a catch cup. And <laughs> oh, wow. They ended up, yeah. They ended up like it was mayhem and they ended up, the teacher ended up killing the spider, which she was sad. She was upset about that, but I was just so yeah. proud of her. Like, I'm like, you, you did that. She goes, yeah. I said, someone get a catch cup, but no one had one. I'm like, yeah. well, everybody lives like, like we do, but yeah. you know, you can't like, look, do I, do I fault her teacher for killing the spider? I can't. Because she's a person, it's outside of a comfort zone, you know. Right. Would I maybe talk to her and maybe get her to think about it next time. Yeah, you know, you can tolerate things that you don't necessarily like. You know, I mean, look, there's plenty of stuff that I don't like. I don't like, you know, I don't like sitting in traffic, but I tolerate it. You know, I mean, my fear, like I started with a fear of spiders. Like, I mean, I I was a, a punk rock kid growing, you know, growing up uh, in West Virginia, and and would run into a spider web and panic you know like have a little little mini freak out because i was like oh the spiders on me and i was like i overcame my fear and became fascinated with spiders uh or you know arthropods in general just through education like the more i learned about them the more i was like well these things aren't as scary as they are in my mind and uh you know it 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 grew from that and my goal in life really (laughs) if it as a father i guess is like if i can just teach my kid that you know, a lot of these animals and insects and stuff that you're afraid of are really, you know, it's just because you don't know, you don't, you don't have the knowledge about them. You know, the more you learn about what you're afraid of, the easier it is to overcome that fear. Um, it doesn't mean you have to like them, but you at least respect them as a living animal, uh, you know, that, that has a right to survive. And, you know, just, just the change I've seen in him since he's, you know, gotten into middle school, uh, and the way he treats animals in general, uh, it, you know, it's not just the fluffy dogs and hamsters and stuff like that, that are cool. Like he's become, we go hiking and he'll find, uh, centipedes and millipedes and all kinds of insects that I co- totally overlooked, didn't even notice. And he's pointing them out to me. And it, that like, that, that warms my heart. You know, it's like, you know, you can't say the world, but at, at least I've kind of, I've taught this kid I'm responsible for, uh, to, you know, appreciate insects and, and arthropods. And, and it's, it's, it's cool doing what, what I'm, what we do, um, because it's, we're bringing that education to people that maybe didn't, you know, they just don't know anything about, uh, you know, they think frogs are slimy and gross and, you know, through your podcast and, and stuff like that, you're able to kind of teach them 
they're they're a lot more fascinating than that and not just that they're a, a very vital part of of the global ecosystem and i think that a lot of times we forget um especially people that aren't involved in the exotic pet hobby uh forget how integral some of these species are that that we just want to kill as soon as we see just because they, they scare us or you know we're freaked out by them and you know it's i think that's why i like what i do a lot just because it, it's fun like i don't expect everybody to like tarantulas like I, you, <laughs> i'm not making tarantula youtube videos because I, i'm going to get rich like i'm not gonna be the next logan paul or something because i would say a wide majority of uh the population that wants nothing to do with with spiders but yeah uh, yeah it is it, it's still it's rewarding to you know be able to showcase them and, and share some information about them and my experience with them and it, it it's always nice getting that that comment or something like that or a message on instagram where somebody's like i hated spiders until i saw your videos uh, i don't want to own any but i i think it's fascinating to watch so you know it that that means the world to me <laughs> but we we're going we're going kind of long man i'm gonna have to wrap this up uh, yeah it's i know been, it kind of went off and down a rabbit hole yeah I looked around and noticed like all the lights are off in my basement. That means it's a uh, bedtime Mine too, actually, <laughs> but I, I've really enjoyed talking to you, Dan. You're my kind of, pre- you're my kind of people. I, I think, uh, I think this is pretty cool. Uh, I, I appreciate you having me on the show. I, I, I really do. And you know, like, like, look, you know, I, I'm not the end all be all expert on anything. You yeah. Know? And, um, you know, I, it's nice having this opportunity to talk. I think that the, our hobbies have a lot in common and, um, now, I want to thank you for allowing me to come on the show and go on my rants and yeah. hopefully enlighten a few people along the way. Definitely. And and I hope that you'd be willing to come back on in the future because I feel like there's a lot left to talk about. We haven't even I would had I a would chance. very much enjoy that. Yes. Thank you. That would be cool. Yeah. So I'm yeah, this this goes out on uh, my second channel, the Exotic Pet Collective, as well as like, you know, on podcasts as well, all the places that you probably have your podcast on as well. But I, then I take clips of it and I put it on my main channel. So, you know, don't be surprised if uh, I cut up this podcast into short little videos <laughs> for the Tarantula Collective as well. Because I think we covered some pretty cool topics. Um, and so just so everybody knows, it's Amphibicast. Uh, you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, are, are you on other, like Stitcher and, and all those other yeah, Buzzsprout? I'm on, um, I'm on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, I believe it's on Stitcher. It's on iHeartRadio. You might be able to find it on the iTunes store. And it's also on my uh, my Buzzsprout website. Yeah. Buzzsprout is the site that that hosts it. So you can really, if you just Google Amphibicast, it should take you to the Buzzsprout site. If not, just subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And, um, you know, if you, if you do like the show, I don't want to, I hate plugging stuff, but, you know, if you do like the show, a nice review on on Apple podcast does help because it helps me get the show out to a wider audience, which is really what I'm looking to accomplish. So if you do enjoy the show, you know, by all means, please take some time to give me a review. Oh, I'll have to do that myself. I, that's, that's a part of podcasting. I didn't even know mm-hmm. existed. <laughs> People leave in reviews. <laughs> I will do that. I'll go on. Yeah. I listen to you on Spotify. I'm going to encourage my listeners to check out your podcast as well, because like I said, I think that there's, there's a lot in common to be had and, I, you know, I do know a fair amount of people who are also into tarantulas and I think that they would really enjoy your show as well. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, it's still, I think this is like maybe the 14th or 15th episode. Um, and I don't even know if that's right. Like it's, uh, it's still pretty new to this and learning how to, how to do everything, but I really enjoy it. I just, you know, I never would have had this conversation with you if it weren't for the podcast, you know, it's like, we're going to cross paths somewhere in life more than likely. So it, it, it's also meeting like-minded people, uh, with different interests. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure my friend Elijah, uh, really appreciates all of the insights you gave him, <laughs> uh, when he listens to this, uh, hopefully he listens to it. Uh, I'm sure he will. Um, he's a good guy. So uh, yeah, uh, it's been a lot of fun and uh, we'll definitely have to do this again. Uh, you know, follow Amphibicast. Uh, I got it linked if you're watching on YouTube, um, on the bottom of the screen there, and I will put links to his podcasts. Uh, and Instagram down below in the description, but it's Amphibicast. You can find it. Uh, just just Google it. I Googled it before we got on the podcast, and that all the results were uh, just different links to uh, your different platforms your podcast was on, or people talking about being on your podcast. So <laughs> it'll be very easy to find if you just uh, just search it. Um, but we upload every Thursday, Exotic Pet Collective. So come back, uh, follow us on the same places you can find Amphibicast. Uh, uh, we're on Instagram, not on Instagram, on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, all of that stuff. But thank you guys for listening. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate you all. And uh, we will see you next Thursday.
ביי. When I see your videos, I, I enjoy watching them. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of attention to detail and you showcase some really interesting species and whatnot. And it's just, it's, it's, it's cool. So what like, I like oh, is I you avoid that whole like spectacle. I mean, look, YouTube is YouTube. I understand people have different interests in doing things and whatnot, but you know, you're not poking them with a stick and watering them every day. If you know what I mean, you know, mm-hmm. so <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I do. So, it, it it's if I was recommending somebody to get into tarantulas, I would recommend you know like Tom Moran, and your channel is really good too. So, thank you. Have thank I kissed you. your ass enough yet? <laughs> <laughs>